Okay, I suggest we start. I, I know people are coming, but I think time is ticking. So, um, good morning, everybody. A very warm welcome to this uh, first Spanish uh, Fusion HPC workshop. Um, on behalf of uh, BSC, Barcelona Supercomputing Center, ARES, the Spanish Supercomputing Network. My name is Mary Mansinen, and I'm the Fusion Group Leader here at BSC and the ICREA Research Professor um, uh, as well. And I will host this welcome session together with my colleague, uh, Jordi Mas Castella Flores. So do you want to take over, Jordi, now? Yes, hello, good morning everyone, and uh, welcome to this Spanish uh, Fusion uh, Workshop, which is supported by the Spanish Supercomputing Network, uh, which uh, normally supports this kind of scientific meetings that really foster the use of HPC in a specific field, in this case, in your field in the, in the research of, of Fusion. Um, first of all, we have to thank, of course, the, the local organizers, especially Rose Gregorio, Mervi, Xavier Saez, uh, I did a little bit myself, but all the BSC Fusion Group for the organization of this meeting. We tend to think that uh, virtual meetings are probably easier than face-to-face uh, -face meetings, which is not true. Uh, some of you may know that, so uh, it's a huge, tremendous work done by the local organization and, and, and I think that we have to thank them so much to persist and, and do the and, and perform the, the meeting uh, today. Especially uh, thanks also to the program committee, eh? Shinpei Futatani from UPC, Edilberto Sanchez, Ciemat, Alejandro Soba from Conecid and BSC, and again Mervi, which is the, the, the alma of this uh, meeting and we have to thank her so much for being so persistent in, in doing this uh, nice and interesting meeting. Now, of course, I think that uh, we have to thank the institutions collaborating with the meeting, uh, especially BSC, La Laboratorio Nacional de Fusión in Ciemat, the UPC, University of, of uh, Polytechnic University of Catalonia, CONICET, uh, ICREA, uh, the Fusion Group of, at BSC and the uh, IOP Publishing uh, Magazine. Uh, so, um, thank you so much for, for letting me be in the, in the welcome session. Thank you, Mervi, and I, I hope you enjoy very much the contents of the meeting. Of course, we would like to meet uh, each one of you in person here in Barcelona today, but uh, unfortunately, we can know we cannot just share hands and, and we, you know, virtually shake hands with you and, and really my best uh, wish to enjoy the meeting. Thank you, Mervi, and please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jordi. Thank you, Mervi. Um, thank you so much, Jordi, for, for your participation, for your support um, being here today. Um, so, and also thank you all, all the participants for connecting and being interested in this program and well already thanks in advance to the other speakers for all your interesting talks and contributions. Uh, looking ahead into the, to, to today's program, um, we have um, three plenary talks programmed. Uh, 10 invited talks and then contributed talks. You can see the um, durations of these talks here. Uh, please, all the speakers know that their duration um, includes time for questions and answers. We really would like to have lively discussion, well, within the boundaries of this um, virtual world that we are facing. Um, the, well, and these contributions, uh, really cover the wide range of HPC applications in Fusion, looking at the well top-notch results uh, that we have from the recent work, reviewing also the past, um, past efforts and results, and then looking ahead 
and really discussing the needs that we are facing when we progress towards the demo and the fusion power plants. And then um, basically there hasn't been any changes that I know of um, over the past days. Um, the program stands as it um, was originally published and you can always check uh, the program on this link on our website. Um, in addition to these talks, um, we will have a chance to join virtual Mare Nostrum tour. This will start at 12.10 uh, and has a duration of about half an hour. And this will be, um, well, in the first part of the lunch break. So you can perhaps grab a sandwich and join this tour um, while uh, uh, just enjoy. Um, enjoy it. Um, towards the end of the day, um, we will have talk by Jordi uh, Mas uh, on the Spanish supercomputing network and praise and resources that are available um, to us through these um, programs. And the closing session um, has the feature. We thought this was attractive feature uh, to keep everybody interested. Um, towards uh, all the way towards the end, uh, we have a voting and announcement of the three favorite talks. So how we have organized this is that we will have two minutes in this closing session to vote for your one vote for your favorite invited or contributed talk, and we will provide the link in this closing session for your votes. And then basically. Um, well, hopefully we, we can decide on those votes, based on those votes, the three and favorite um, talks and the winners um, would get the prize. Um, we would be sending them um, the Dan Brown origin books, which features Mare Nostrum, Barcelona and Spain, together with some equipment that makes your next video conference perhaps more comfortable. And these prizes are sponsored by BSC and our um, BSC Fusion. Um, let me, uh, and then some practicalities before we go and start our program. So um, all of you have received uh, emails about the, the Zoom rooms. We have two parallel Zoom rooms in this meeting and you have the connection details in those emails. Um, what we want to promote is the free movement between these two rooms and make to make this work nicely for everybody we really would like to ask all the speakers to keep to the time allocated so that i mean people don't miss um, parts of your talk when they try to move between the talks and the chairs are there to help you um, if needed uh, in this timekeeping uh, the Questions and answers we are organizing by the Zoom chat function. And the chat will be enabled towards the end of each talk. Please, um, please keep in mind that there might be delay in the chat. We don't know how it functions. So uh, when you see it enabled during the, uh, towards the end of the talk, just start putting questions so that we can smoothly go to, to your questions and address them as, as, uh, as well as possible and try to be concise in your questions. So the plan is that the chair of each talk will read their question so that everybody knows what question is being uh, uh, answered. And then the speakers don't re really need to bother about the chat at all. They just, well, have a lively discussion then based on those questions that are passed by the chair to each speaker. And um, we are recording this workshop so if you want to stay anonymous, please change your name to something else in this Zoom. Um, and for the quality of everyone's connections, um, please switch off your video when you are not talking. And at the, well, before the first break, we would like to take a crew photo. Let's hope you remember. So then we would ask you to switch, um, switch on your video and um, um, 
smile basically, <laughs> if you're happy to participate in this group photo. Um, and always, if you have any questions, please send an email to this email address here, hpcfusion at bsc.s. Um, especially we encourage all the speakers to check whether they have said, well, if, so all the speakers should have sent us their slides for backup so that we can drive those slides for you. If, if you have sent them um, and you haven't got the confirmation from us that, about the receipt, please come back to us so that we can check what might have gone wrong and then find alternative way of parsing these parts. I think that's, that's basically it. Um, many issues. So how are we to, doing time? Yes, it's, it's time now to go to the first talk of the day. We have a great pleasure of uh, hearing um, a talk from Alberto Loarte from ITER organization on modeling needs uh, to support the ITER research plan and the role of HPC. So basically, Albert, are you able to, Alberto, are you able to share the slides? Basically, I hope, the room I is hope yours. So. <laughs> I hope so. Is yours. Okay, so I think that, uh, can you see them? Uh, yes, now it's up, so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, thank you. So thank you very much for this invitation. I am very pleased to see so many people connected. So I'm going to give you a, a summary of the modeling needs to support the ITER research plan and the role that we see for the ITER FPC. So this is a, re a recent photo of the of the ITER side where despite the pandemic, there have been quite a lot of uh, work going on this year. We have been, I think, rather lucky and the management has been rather well organized. So of course there are impacts like everywhere, but they are relatively moderate, I would say, for what they could have been. So the introduction of the, of the talk first, I want just to give you just a few minutes so that you see the many things that have happened this year. Then I will give a, an overview, short overview of the ITER research plan and the stage approach. Then ITER modeling needs, um, and then the role of, of the of high power computing to support the ITER research plan. I will go to the to the conclusion. So I go to the introduction and construction status. Of course, as you know, ITER uh, aims to demonstrate the scientific and technological feasibility of fusion energy. And of course, we tend to be very focused on the scientific side, but the technological side is also important. So this we should not forget because for some of these things, we really need to have um, also very detailed physics model for the technology assessment. So as you know, our goal is to achieve Q of at least 10 for 300 to 500 seconds. For this, the baseline scenario of ITER is a 50 mega 5.3 Tesla. So this is a conventional H mode, I would say, with um, some uh, degree of end control. Uh, probably suppression is required for ITER. Then long pulse operation. This is a, like what we call typically hybrid scenarios to extend the pulse length to 1,000 seconds. And here we don't require um, complete uh, current drive. So we expect to have a significant amount of current driven by the plasma, but not complete. And then we have a steady state operation where we really want to achieve a steady state with fully non-inductive current drive. And because of um, engineering limits of cooling, etc., the pulse is limited to, the burn is, is limited to 3000 seconds, but actually the pulse is really steady state. It's just the, what limits this, the length of this pulse is, is hardware, not the, the physics of the pulse. And what we have drafted uh, in the last years, and actually with some people that are connected, like Xavier, is the ITER research plan where we explain the logic and the steps that we have to follow to get to these objectives. So I said this year, despite the, the challenges of the pandemic, there have been major progress on, in 2020. So the first thing is that the Tokamak building has been completely finished. Uh, the crane, the crane uh, now is there and we can start assembling the machine. We have uh, received all the large components that are required to start assembly. This includes uh, on-site uh, manufactured products, uh, components, but also from outside. And we had a ceremony to mark the start of assembly that I will show um, 
the, the assembly started at the end of, of May this year. We have now two out of uh, six poloidal coils are finished and they are being cold tested. And we are actually starting some of the basic uh, plant systems to commission, such as the, the cooling water system. And next year we start with the cryo plant, which is the largest in the world, by the way. So uh, we have been showing many years uh, pictures of ITER buildings, which I find a bit boring for fusion. But OK, now we are there. So you can see this building finished, where there has been a, actually a big uh, leader, a, a big uh, partner of this contract actually is Ferrovial, Agromam. And this has now been finished by F4E. It was finished in spring this year. And uh, so we, I think from now on, we will never show pictures of ITER buildings. We will show this, which is much more interesting. So these are the, actually, as I mentioned, the start of assembly. So this is the, the, the picture of the base of the cryostat being lower on, on place. And on the left side, you can see that this thing rests on some, um, some um, um, uh, components that transmit the forces to the, to the ground. So this is the, the very important piece because this is the interface between the tokamak itself and the, and the building. So this takes all the stresses, the interface with all the stresses for disruptions, for earthquakes, for everything. And here you see the next step, which came shortly after, which is the, the second part of the vessel. So he can, here you can see the diverter ports, the lower ports of the machine, the equatorial ports, the ones which most of them are square. But if you look on the right side, there are some sort of uh, oval shape one. This is where the neutral beams go. So these are the three heating neutral beams and the diagnostic neutral beams. So one, as you know, in the baseline of ITER, there are there are two neutral beams and there is space for a third one. And these are people working actually this this um, this cylinder at the top to the base at the bottom. And this is going on at the moment. This photo is of a few days ago. So as I said, to celebrate this, there was a, in July a celebration marking the start of assembly. This is the Torus Hall with the what we call the subsector assembly tool. So this is where the vacuum vessel will go. And these vertical pillars that you see on the left and the right, this is where toroidal field coils will go. So they will put like a vacuum vessel in the middle of these structures and from the size that to TF course will be assembled. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, this, this meeting, of course, had to be remote, and it had intervention from many of the heads of states of the of the inter parties. I said other things that are ongoing and are being finished and under testing are the diverter coils. These are on site. This is a European coil that was procured in China by SIPP. And this is a European coil being built at ITER itself in the PF building. And these two are, this one is under testing and this is being prepared for testing. So we are, as I said, we don't show any more pictures of buildings, but we now really saw pictures of the components of ITER. The same thing uh, is for the central solenoid. So you can see here in General Atomics in California, the central solenoid uh, elements, there are seven, six plus one spare, which have been built uh, by General Atomics. And the first one is actually going to be shipped very soon. And the second one is, is ready for testing. So as I said, uh, we, we have now got all the components to start the machine assembly. And this basically starts with vacuum vessel and TF coils. So here you can see the first manufactured TF coil, which was Japanese. But also the, here you can see the first uh, coil that arrived at the ITER side, which was European because it was finished in Italy and therefore the trip was shorter. And the vacuum vessel, the first vacuum vessel sector built in Korea. So now we, with these tools that you can use, I saw in the in the previous photograph, and you can see near the vacuum vessel on the right, these pillars. We are starting the the we are going to start the the machine assembly. At the moment, there are a lot of work going on on the met, doing metrology, um, helium leak testing of the vacuum vessel, etc. So there is a lot of work going on on these components to be. To be assembled. And you can see here, for instance, people that are familiar with ITER model, this is the famous triangular support on the vacuum vessel that provides vertical stability. So we have been seeing, I have to say, for people that have been modeling ITER for a very long time, we have seen many times the cut drawings of these things, but now you can actually see here the components themselves. And I think this is of a great, a great achievement that we we all have to share, the ITER organization and all the ITER members particularly this year, which is so difficult. 
So now that I've shown you that we are not anymore, as I said, cut drawings and buildings, but components being assembled, I will go uh, a short introduction on what we plan to do with the ITER research plan. So as you know, the ITER research plan describes how we are going to go from integrated commission of the machine to the achievement of the ITER goals. So we have uh, several phases, uh, like many experiments, like JT6 TSA. So we have an initial phase with a very basic uh, component configuration in which we will just demonstrate that the machine runs, that we can make plasmas, but these are very low current plasmas. Then we will install the, and this is important because if there is an issue with coils or vacuum, etc., we should identify it earlier before we, we install more things. So in the second phase, we will install all the in-vessel components and in-vessel coils and um, ECH heating only. And then we will do first L-mode and H-mode operation. Then this will be followed by more, comp more heating systems, ICH and MBI and diagnostics. Then we will demonstrate that the machine can run up to 50 mega. And then after that, we go into DT and we demonstrate the achievement of the ITER goals. So as I mentioned, the ITER research plan that was elaborated with the contribution from the ITER members, uh, experts that participated in several workshops and has evolved. We started with the first one in 2008. Now it's kind of more frozen. And um, since the machine, as I said, is, is now being assembled, so there are many fewer uncertainties. And I'm going to describe a bit what, what we want to achieve in each phase. So in the first phase, we plan to do integrated commissioning of the system, magnetic calibration is essential. If not, we cannot run. And the main goal is the demonstration that we can actually make breakdown and a very low plasma current. This is already quite complicated in ITER because the volume of the vacuum vessel is, is very large. And breakdown in such a large vacuum vessel is, is not trivial. And then we will test the coils to full current fulfilled to be sure that the machine will work. So after that, uh, we will go into the initial program with very low heating power, 20 mega hours of heating. At the moment, it's being discussed if we could increase this to 30 mega hours of ECH heating. And the objectives in this phase is to go to seven and a half mega amps, which is half current, half fill, or the maximum, the demonstration of the disruption mitigation system. This is essential. As you know, disruptions in ITER are, and in all tokamak devices, large is a problem. We have to be sure we mitigate their effects and the demonstration of, of exploring at least if we can get H mode operation at a reduced field and current. So that you see what is the, the place where we are going to move in the in the ITER research plan. In this phase, here we compare, and I will show many plots of this type. This is the field at the bottom and the current at the top with the star where we want to go. So for L mode, we assume we will operate up to 50% of the lingual limit as maximum. So this is why this scale here is from zero to 0 0.5. In other plots, when we show H mode, we, as you know, we tend to operate rather close to the lingual limit for Q equal 10, and then it will be from zero to 10 to 20. So you see, we are restricted at rather low currents. And because of the ECH, we have to be in regions where the ECH is deposited relatively central. This is the first stage mode confinement uh, in red, and, and the other are, are um, L mode plasmas. This, this plot, I think you have seen before if you, you attended the APS a few years ago because it comes from, from uh, Mireille Schneider. So, the second phase, the idea is to, as I said, to demonstrate that the machine can run in H mode up to 7.5 uh, mega 2.65 Tesla. And this is because we have only 73 mega hours of heating. And of course, the H mode threshold in hydrogen and helium is rather large compared to the T. So, we cannot operate higher. And to demonstrate that, that we can operate up to 50 mega amp in L mode. And for this, we have all the baseline heating power, which is 73 mega watts. And of course, we will characterize also, if we do it in helium plasmas, we need to characterize uh, interactions because we don't want to reduce the diverter lifetime because we operate in helium. So uh, this is the operational space that we plan to see in H-Mode with all the resonance of the RF heating and the limitations of the sign through from the MBI. So you see how we are going to go up. So we have chosen a semi-constant Q route to, to 50 mega amp to maintain self-similarity from MHD, but there are many restrictions on the density, on the field we can operate. So this is actually a rather tricky way up. And uh, because of this, we are doing quite a lot of modeling and I see Elena is connected to this and Elena is leading one of the contracts we have with the, 
with the UKAA to model all these plasmas that we ensure we can get there, that we don't have problems of tungsten accumulation, etc., for which we need the integrated modeling. The H mode operation, as I said, is rather restricted. And one of the issues you see is that, for instance, for hydrogen plasma, we are very, very restricted in terms of uh, both of power and in of sign through. So it is this this operation that is why we our reference operation is in helium, and we are exploring what we can do in hydrogen. And to understand the problem that we have, you can see here the expected H mode threshold, which is uh, from 58 in hydrogen and 38 megawatts in, in in helium. And note that for uh, hydrogen operation ICH, we don't have a, a viable coupling scheme in pure hydrogen plasma. So the modeling of this is very complicated and the integration is and this is why I said we have done uh, we have placed a special contract with F4E and uh, and UKA to assess the integrated modeling of these scenarios to see which are feasible and which are not. Now when we go to after we have demonstrated H mode operation and full full power operation at high current, we will go of course to the DT program where we start in D plasmas and then we go up gradually to DT operation. We demonstrate the 50 mega goal and then the, the, the final goal of Q equal five long pulse and steady state. And this is what is described in the ITER research plan, which we published now two, two years ago as a, an ITER report. We are working now on doing a nuclear fusion paper, by the way. So here you see what is the path uh, in H mode. This is so just in H mode. We go up. So you can see that all the time we reproduce the same path. Here there are various diversions depending on the scenario we want to go. So if we want to go to 50 mega amp, the present route is to go up the ladder this way. If you want to go to steady state, then the, the foreseen route is to go at constant current and, and changing the field. These are the, the final goals of it. So the plan is to go first to 50 mega amp, then to 12 and a half mega amp, steady state, the long pulse, and then to, to, to steady state because it's the most difficult one. So uh, now I go to the description of the ITER modeling needs that we have to achieve to, to, to show these goals, to demonstrate these goals. Uh, so as I said, the ITER modeling needs are wide. And for instance, I made the comment of the viability of specific scenarios. And many need a high computer, a high power computing, others less. Uh, one thing which I'm going to discuss is the IMAS framework. For us, it's very interesting. This is the framework in which we want to do all our modeling um, uh, studies. Uh, because it's a uniform framework to couple codes. This is based on the on the work uh, pioneered by the European Integrated Tokamak uh, Modeling Task Force. And uh, this is the general framework of our codes. And we are slowly but surely adapting all the codes to, that we use to, to use this framework. Then I will just give some examples of the way we use uh, ITER modeling to, to, to assess ITER scenarios. And I will give some examples which are on the high, I would say, Q scenarios, but also other things that maybe don't make it so clear to the community, but are required that are more, I would say, simpler modeling and is maybe less um, flashy, but is equally important because of the technology demonstration part of it. Another thing which is not so clear to the community is that we actually need uh, modeling for, for data analysis. And this concerns uh, uh, synthetic diagnostics to, to actually control, to have models for control the scenarios to assess the the, the performance of the plasma to see what we can actually find out from the plasma with the diagnostics that we have, but also high level analysis due to including measurement consistency. We need to know what is the best density profile that we have from the ITER diagnostics and not just use one. Uh, um, for this, for as I said, for some of these things, you need high computing modeling. For other things where we really uh, use routinely high power computer models are specific um, plasma processes. So for instance, we have a rather intense program on disruption and disruption mitigation modeling. We have also a rather intense program on MEM control because these are the, the tra control of transients essential for ITER. And here the, the routine is to use um, uh, uh, high power computing. So as I said, the first step is the framework in which we do the modeling. This is the integrated modeling analysis should. It uses a modular approach that builds up on the data representation. As I said, this builds up on the work started by the, by the European Modeling uh, Task Force. 
uh, we have a standard descriptions to for any machine, not only for ITER, to represent the data. And the good thing is that this allows the ITER members to contribute to the developments, including, for instance, we are developing a high plasma fidelity simulator and components inside and data processing analysis tool. So the idea is that whatever is developed for ITER, of course, is shared and validated in present experiments. And this for us is, is important. The tutorials are available in this web page you can access. And if you cannot access, then you have to send an email to Oliver Hennen, who is connected, and he will give you access to it. The data dictionary defines the structuring and naming of data. So we use the same data structure for all data. As I said, it's not restricted to ITER. Uh, we support various languages. And, and basically, with this uh, data dictionary, then we build up interface data structures, which are uh, standardized entities we use between software and uh, components and storage. So we have uh, things that describe uh, plant systems, we describe uh, plasma systems. And the good thing is that this is all very traceable because one of the problems that we find in usually in present experiments uh, when we do the modeling is that there is, uh, while I think in data, in data um, analysis, the, the situation regarding provenance is better established. In modeling, is much less, much less uh, better established, and sometimes it's very difficult to actually reproduce results. So that you know more or less how it works, we have an, uh, an access layer that uh, uh, couples codes using IDSs. So if you adapt the code to handle this, then it's very simple to to link it to any other code because the, stand, the, the, the interfaces are standard. And OK, it is a bit painful because, of course, we all have our codes adapted to our own system. But once you do it, then it can be you can take advantage of using other codes that are developed for ITER in a rather simple way in terms of, of interfaces. You don't need to create a specific interfaces. So I go to some of the applications of this module that we have created. So one of them that we are working on is a high fidelity plasma simulator. Uh, Xavier will uh, describe a similar effort now developing Europe based on the ETS. We have started an effort based on gene track and DINA. And uh, as we saw that the IEA, we have now been able to model a full scenario from beginning to end, modeling the plasma but also the core plasma and the currents in the coil, but also uh, with the typical, uh, I would say, uh, uh, restrictions on the PF coils. But we have also calculated the power fluxes, impurity influxes in the plasma. So this is really to the, let's say, of course, with not fully very detailed models, because we use simplified models in some cases for con transport, like GLF23, etc. But these are simulations which are really complete from the core to the diverter target. And this has allowed us, and this was shown by Elina at the IA 2016, to actually model in detail not only the flat top, which people like to do a lot, but also the access and exit, which are actually the more difficult phases. And so, for instance, we have been able to show that we can control power fluxes to the diverter, but that we actually, if we run the density very fast, the plasma does a transition to H mode, but then it falls out of H mode because the temperature in the core doesn't stay high enough, and then you don't get the alpha heating. So we can do really, these simulations take a lot of time, they are integrated, but we can calculate really a complete evolution of the plasma. And the same thing on the right side for the termination of the plasma. This, of course, like landing a plane is always more difficult than taking off. And one has to be very careful the way you do, the way you ramp the power. So here we have taken some cases in which we ramp the power very fast to see how the, the, the termination is robust. And uh, we have got some cases in which the plasma actually disrupts. So for instance, if you run the power very fast and you, in the red case on the right, if you don't put a bit of power while the plasma is going down, that plasma would disrupt. So we learn how to control the plasma. And these things are very important when we want to design iterate scenarios and apply them in the future. And you can see that in all cases, both in the access and exit phase, we keep the power under 10 megawatts per square meter, which is our, our guidance. 
Another thing that we have done recently is to evaluate uh, the operation ITER in steady state. This was discussed at, when we developed the ITER research plan, and the main issue was to which level we had to rely on the use of lower hybrid to achieve this. So we have actually done quite a lot of integrated modeling simulation with Astra, plus this was with boundary conditions. Now we are going to do this with the full uh, gene track DINA, and uh, to show that actually we can um, develop this type of scenarios by using MBI and ECH. Actually, this builds up on the work that I think uh, uh, Xavier and, and Geronimo started many years ago. And uh, well, actually, you can see that, of course, you have to take some assumptions regarding core transport that we cannot prove. But uh, this is something that we would actually assess with high computation, high power computing. And if with the confinement of ITER is good enough, with the pedestal we expect to have, which is rather high, and the difference, I think, compared to what Xavier and Geronimo did before is that now we have a MHD model to calculate the pedestal and a boundary condition for the density, so we can predict well the plasma stability. We can get these plasmas for which we need to upgrade the beam, so we have to install the third beam, and we need to actually put more ECH. And one of the things we have studied is whether what are the problems of stability of this plasma. So this is shown on this slide. And basically, these plasmas are limited by resistive wall mode because they are at very high beta. But also, they have a, a internal modes due to the fact that we have very high pressure gradients. You can see here that in this region where the beams are deposited, you can have very large pressure gradients and current gradients. And this leads to a very flat profile of the density with very large pressure gradients. And this is very bad because you trigger internal modes which are very disrupted, as everybody knows, working on, on a strong ITVs, that they are very disrupted because of this. So what we have shown is that by playing with the ECH uh, uh, launcher, we can actually, the, this is the equatorial launcher built by Japan and the upper launchers for Europe. We can actually control the stability and get a plasma with reasonable stability in, in, the, in the core. So this is shown on the right side where the dotted line is the plasma beta and the other are limits depending on where we put the, the ECH. So you see that depending on what you do, you get more stability of high end and you reduce it at low end or the opposite. So this is uh, to show that the, the heating system give us the capability to control the plasma. I said these are the typical things that I would imagine you expect. Now I'm going to show other things that we do that maybe you don't expect. And these are more practical, well, sorry, I have to finish this one and then I go to the more practical one. So one thing we have also done, and this was shown at the EPS by Sanji Kim, is not only to, to model the flat top, but to model the axis. And here, what we have been looking is how we optimize the heating and current drive waveform so that we can actually access to the, to the scenario in a stable way. And this is what is shown on the, on the left, is the, the plasma shape evolution and the heating and current ramp shape evolution to 10 mega. On the right is the stability of the plasma. And you can see here that by doing the, the ramp up this way, since we create rather, I would say, extraordinary crew profiles, by doing the ramp up this way, you are able to keep the plasma, the dotted line, under all stability limits. As I said close to the to the flat top, of course, we are very close to stability, depending on the current profile. We are stable, marginal, as you would expect, because this plasma is pushing the limit, but during the access phase, we don't hit any limit. So we have really a consistent scenario. And now what we have to look into this scenario, and this is the future work, is compatibility with power fluxes, tungsten contamination, etc. I said other things that we do with modeling that maybe are less known, because they are more, I would say, practical. And this is what I said is the, the the demonstration of, of, uh, of the technical feasibility of ITER is, uh, for instance, and this type of modeling we do to understand what strategy we can do regarding, for instance, tritium removal. So for instance, what I saw here, we had many years ago, and we actually did the studies with the 4E, what was the maximum current that we, which would operate the, the diverter um, with race strike points. And the, the reason to do that was originally triggered by the findings of JET that when you have a beryllium wall and a tungsten diverter, you tend to get a lot of the position at the high field side. So we had this idea that basically every shot in the ramp down during the rundown phase, we would have a phase with increased strike point position uh, in L mode, um, let's say at up to 10 mega to remove by plasma flow and heating up the, the deposits 
uh, the, the tritium, which is absorbed. So the idea was that every shot would have a phase in which you would recover the tritium, which is deposited in every shot, because we know that building up of layers with tritium trapped inside in beryllium makes life very complicated from the jet experience to remove it. And so we have designed this type of scenarios, but we have done now the analysis of the, whether actually this is feasible or not. And what we found is we saw that the Asian plasma physics uh, meeting a few weeks ago is that actually this strategy doesn't work because due to the heat flux expansion that you have there and the power that we want, we can put in these diverter targets, which is limited by five megawatts, by five megawatts actually in this upper region, even with 20 megawatts, we don't get really very high power load. So we have calculated the temperature of the diverter surface, which of course in it is water cool, and this actually 200. And at 200 C, basically you don't remove any tritium. You remove only 20% of the tritium deposited. So this is an example of where you use modeling to assess rather, I would say, practical things of the of the discharges. So we don't only have to do very high sophisticated modeling of MHZ stability and fast particle. We also can use modeling to assess uh, things of, let's say, of the technical feasibility of fusion. And certainly to keep tritium in the machine low is, is essential for this. So another thing we have done, but I see Mervi is coming up. So <laughs> I will, uh, so we are doing also synthetic diagnostic modeling uh, quite intensely and the high level diagnostic analysis. And this concerns that, as I said, trying to get measurements here, we are using the, the technique uh, pioneer based on the Bayesian probability approach. And this uh, actually starting work. Now I go very briefly to the computing support at high power to the, to the ITER research plan. So as I said here, our main focus at the moment is the control of transient loads because this is very important for ITER, but also we are thinking in the future of the things where this could be rather useful. So for uh, disruption modeling and electromagnetic uh, loads, we have developed a quite sophisticated suite of models. These have to do, these are non-resistive uh, MHD models. They are conventional models. So we don't take into account 3D asymmetry. So this, we calculate the average, but because the wall of ITER is actually 3D shape, uh, loads during disruption can lead to significant heat loads and also localize. So for this, we have built a, a workflow that actually calculate this, and you can estimate the heat load on the diverter, the melting of the diverter, the movement of the melt layer, etc. And for instance, one of the things we have identified is that basically, due to the loads during the current quench, actually, we can do up to seven and a half mega amps uh, disruptions uh, without melting the diverter. This is our threshold. Of course, the issue here is uh, that we cannot really, uh, um, this, this assumes no asymmetry. So of course, if you have asymmetries, you go down in, in current. Another thing we are intensely working and the, the Europe is actually playing a very important role, is the modeling of disruptions, disruption mitigation. This is very important for ITER, as I said, this is the first thing we want to demonstrate as soon as we operate the machine. And this is based, our concept is based on the Sutter pellet injector, where you inject a rather large pellet of neon and deuterium, as it is done at JET at the moment. The pellet is shattered and you inject some shards, which are absorbed by the plasma to increase the density and radiate the power. This has a very complicated system. You can see an example here. These of the size of a bus, even if it looks small here. And there are three of them at the equatorial, um, at the equatorial level and uh, another three of them at the upper level, but with only one injector. So the objective of this uh, system is to radiate the plasma energy away and to also increase the density, we don't get runaways. And here we have intensive MHD modeling, a large part of it done, by the way, with the Joret code, in which, for instance, we have looked at how we can make the radiation more symmetric if we inject pellets from various toroidal locations. And this is what is shown on the left side, where it's shown that you can decrease the the, the picking factor of the radiation when you de inject the pellets by a factor of two. These are the moment being tested in K-star. And also we have models here, for instance, for JET, what you get in terms of the density to suppress runaways. And here the news are a bit more complicated because you can see that the density rise you get is strongly affected by MHD, so it's not uniform. So you cannot, uh, these are actually, to be fair, the, the point of disruption mitigation of runaways, the, the thing that is more open where we need more, more research. 
Another thing we do is uh, Elm control modeling. This is actually also strongly based on Jorek and Nimrod. And here you have results from, from Simpei, where he identified the minimum size of the pellet to get Elm suppression, to, sorry, to get Elm triggering with pellets. And here are results from Marina Beck demonstrating that at 60 kilo and we can actually get them suppression either but of course at the cost of reducing the pedestal density and temperature and the impact on confinement and on the top is the the value the the end control system for it so finally the last thing i will show has to do with the losses of fast particles, the ELMS, uh, the, the use of 3D fields lead to significant fast particle losses. And we have to be very careful that these are optimized. And we have ongoing work. You can see here, and this is another, another area where physics and technology meet, because we can actually calculate with the present cost power loads even in an exposed piece of the diverter. And we have to use supercomputers to calculate this. Because this is very important if we would put by fast particle losses to large loads on the exposed pipe the inverter dome, of course, we would we would get a water leak. So briefly, I want to mention, because Mervi is the chair of this session, is that we can also use high power computer to run complicated uh, flow, workflows in parallel to modeling. And for instance, here we have a work which is the result of collaboration between the ITER organization and the EU which is the heating and current drive workflow was based on the work of people like Mervi and Thomas Johnson, etc., where we can couple models of different levels of sophistication that can be run in parallel computers if we need to, couple to heating and to, to transport codes. And this is an area where I think high power computer can really help in the in the calculation of it. Similarly, we can use neural networks to, to speed up bottlenecks, for instance, transport modeling. This is a typical one, and here's an example of qualities. So these are the areas where we see that you may not be using maybe high power computers as such to, to do the modeling of ITER, but for instance, to develop networks. And here we could think you know, of running millions of sol PS runs and developing neural networks that then we can plug into the transport codes, and we don't need to run GeneTrack with all the transport and everything inside which takes several months, by the way. So finally, I go to my conclusion. As I said, the heater construction is going well. There will be, of course, some delays, but they are not a disaster compared to the situation in which we are. So the ITER research plan requires modeling support to develop and, and define scenarios, to prepare workflows uh, of experimental data, and also to assess specific aspects of ITER scenarios. So here we can go from, as I said, tritium removal to very sophisticated fast particle instabilities. And we expect the the high power computers to support this effort by sophisticated modeling, but for instance, also to support uh, I said, development of neural networks by doing massive calculations with simple codes just to provide CPU ca power capability. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alberto. This was really nice. Nice overview where, about ITER status and mm. also about your needs, right? Yeah. Um, now, basically, the chat is open. We are, we are receiving already the first question. So I, I suggest that I go there uh, immediately, mm -hmm. those ones. Um, what I would like to mention now before we go there is that many people um, have wrong name in their participant list. That this is an error from our side. So there is an option for everybody to change the name Cover um, your mouse over over yourself in the list of participants. You can rename yourself. So um, please uh, please uh, use that option. Um, that will simplify our well our organization here. That we know who is who is connected, especially the speakers. <laughs> so let's let's go to the questions. Um, we have here first question from Xavier Litadon. Mm -hmm. um, let's go. Uh, so, what are your needs in terms of breakdown and burn through simulations? Um, okay. Very good. So this is one thing I didn't include, but <laughs> but actually we have done the the needs on breakdown and and, and and startup simulation. They are buried. So we have done a very basic model of the of the plasma breakdown, but this is an area 
where the physics is not very well known. So what we are doing at the moment is to apply relatively simple models with some average impurity concentration to find out what are the pressures in which we get slide away electrons and we don't get slide away electrons. One thing which is very poorly known, by the way, is the effect of ECH on these plasmas. And I have to say there, I didn't mention it because of a lack of time, but we have a collaboration with Forschung Centrum Julich, but not with the plasma part, but with the computing part. And they have recently concluded a study of a 3D with a basically a particle in cell model to model these plasmas. And as I said, the main problem in ITER is that the, the vacuum vessel is very large. So the, when you start the, the, the breakdown, the plasma is relatively small compared to the volume. And you have a lot of gas that you have to ionize. And the balance of these things so that it goes right, it is not trivial. At the same time, of course, we don't apply a very high field. So this is was described to some degree in the paper of Peter de Vries, which I mentioned, but there is more, as I said, coming in a dedicated paper on um, on detailed modeling with a with a with a supercomputer where you do real real model of the plasma and the electrons in the initial phase with the with the particle in cell model. By, this is done by the, I said, this is not done by the, by Forsun Centrum in Julie from the plasma physics side, but from the computing side, by the computer side there. Mm -hmm. um, I see that Xavier has many questions, but uh, for, for fairness, I take Jeronimo Garcia's question next. How it plans to balance pure scientific research exploitation, if any, and pure plasma development towards DT at 50 megaamps. Okay, so this this is something which is being discussed at the moment. I think that in the the there is the the fact that the ether research plan of course has some clear target doesn't mean that there will not be scientific research. I think this is a misunderstanding. I think maybe this was driven by previous management of ITER, but the present management of ITER realized that ITER is a scientific facility. So the question is how we do the balance, because we have to get to the objectives and we have to demonstrate Q equal 10. And uh, my expectation is that if there will be many surprises, when we start ITER plasmas, things may be not exactly as we want or we think they are, and there will be a lot of research. There are still, as I said, many, many issues open. For instance, ITER will be the first plasma in which a neutral penetration compared to machine size is very inefficient. So ITER is going to really discover new worlds. Is the first, I mean, according to our modeling, um, uh, the density profiles in the ITER pedestal will be flat. This nobody has ever seen. So it could be that all the MHD stability of the H plasma in H mode is different from what we know today. The collisionality is low. You have very high bootstrap current. You have very high density. So I expect that there will be much more research than people think. The ITER research plan is drafted according to our present knowledge because we have to have a plan which is consistent with what we know. But it is true that there are areas of ITER where our present knowledge is very incomplete. That it was that is why it goes in phases. So because we expect to discover new things, and when we discover new things, we will have to understand them and optimize them. So I, I think actually it is going to be a, a, a new world of plasma physics. I think. Okay. Thanks. Um, I think we have one more question here. Or time for one more question. So let's go back to Xavier Litaranj. The second one is, what is your approach for remote data access? Well, the approach for remote data access is we the 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 the, the, the data is collected in the control room. And then uh, we have built, uh, well, we haven't built, but there will be a building in ITER, which is called the Scientific Data Center. And there will be a news line on Monday that describes this, for which the DG has actually provided the funding. So the data will be shipped from the control room to outside the control room. The control room, of course, in ITER, since in a nuclear installation is very tightly controlled, what you can do there. But outside the control room, it will be stored. And from there, it will be distributed to the ITER members. So the, the data will be basically accessible after every shot within seconds. Now, how the ITER members plan to access is varied. We will have a backup of this, of this data. 
uh, for for regulations at some distance from from ITER, it will be decided. But then from there on, it will go outside. And actually, one of the things that I see, Susana, one of the things we want to do is we are going to do some test uh, with the with the uh, uh, IFERC center in Japan. This is one thing we are actually working now to do test some tests for remote data access from Japan, because to test you know high throughput and long distance. I think from Europe it will be simpler, from far away it will be more complicated. So there are, for instance, uh, I know that there are some domestic agencies, non the EU, that are thinking of establishing a data center near ITER. But this is to the ITER members. We provide the ITER data outside the control room, and then from there on, the ITER members have full access to it. Thank you so much, Alberto. Um, time is up. Okay. And so we need to move to the second Thank you. Talk. Thank you so much. Can you unshare your screen, please? So that um, our next speaker, Susanna Clement from um, Future for Energy, um, has the room then. Please go ahead, Susanna, when you are ready. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Okay, I'm going to try the screen sharing. And if there is a lot of latency, I will ask you to pass the slides because I am right now in Rokasho in Japan. No problems, we are prepared for that. I can see the slide already. Do I need to make it full screen or does it work like this? Well, I think it would be better if you would manage full screen mode. Okay. Be bigger. That looks perfect. Okay. So then, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for the invitation. This talk is going to be a bit less scientific in nature, but I hope to give you an idea of the role of HPC in the broader activity, in the broader approach activities, and also of uh, how it came to be. So it's uh, mostly about our Helios uh, HPC. Uh, I will give you a bit of historical background, the motivation and goal of how, uh, to set, how we set the Computational Simulation Center, or CSC, and then how uh, Helios was uh, thought of, procured, operated, and dismantled. A few words about the scientific output and its influence in our various programs, and then uh, some summary and general outlook. So here you can see uh, the Rokasho site. So the HPC Helios operated for five years between 2012 and 2017 in IFERC, which means International Fusion Energy Research Center in the north of Japan, you can see in the map. And uh, you can see also the kind of weather we get here. So why did we put an HPC here? Why was it free involved and who were the intended users? Uh, so a bit of background. In 2004, we had the ITER negotiations blocked by two side proposals, uh, which each had three supporters, one in Kadarash and one in Rukasho. So at that point, India had not joined the ITER negotiations and probably if they had, we would not have broader approach because there was no possibility of a, of a lock. So to unblock the deal, Europe and Japan conducted negotiations on a hypothetical host, non-host agreement where whoever lost the ITER site will be able to choose projects in their territory. And so the broader approach to fusion energy was born in 2005. So the agreement uh, uh, was a bit uh, strange as these things go because the contribution, economic contribution in the case of Europe came mostly from uh, voluntary contributions from a number of countries that had a particular interest in ITO coming to Europe, in particular France, and they provided 90% of the budget, uh, the rest being covered by FRE. And FRE was nominated the implementing agency, which is similar to the uh, domestic agency in the case of ITER. So the projects were, as you probably know, the upgrade of JT60 in NACA, uh, 
uh, activities of design and prototype construction for IFMIF, so called IFMIF EVEDA. And then finally, IFERC, which is the name of a project besides the name of a site. And uh, this was a bit of a mixed bunch. It had to fulfill the expectations of the local politicians of having something related to ITER in Rogasho. So one of the projects is the ITER Remote Experimentation Center or, or REC, which Alberto mentioned in regarding our work for remote data access and so on. Then uh, it had, uh, as IFERC had to contribute to the two sites roadmaps to fusion energy. So there were also demo design and demo R&D activities. Uh, and then finally, an idea was to cover some obvious needs of the EU and Japan fusion communities and their own HPCs were coming to, to uh, their end time. So France as main voluntary contributor through CEA contributed an HPC to be placed in Rukasho. So here you have the Helios HPC and the motivation, okay, besides the scientific motivation, which you know better than anyone, the goal for the CSC was the provision and exploitation of a supercomputer for large scale simulation activities to analyze experimental data on fusion plasmas, prepare scenarios for ITER operation, predict the performance of the ITER facilities and contribute to demo design. So the emphasis on support to ITER was very big since the beginning. So the CSC was established uh, as planned and uh, it was a dedicated state-of-the-art supercomputer in that um, it was used only for fusion simulation activities. FRE, as I said, provided the HPC through CEOA. And uh, we had also the help of the high-level support team in Garching and the left first and later Eurofusion to support the users. And JAA, later renamed QST, procured the building, the infrastructure equipment, and provided also electricity and support to the users. So what kind of leap did the Helios signify in 2009? I think uh, the most used uh, HPC in Europe was the Ulich HPC FF machine with its 8,000 cores. And on the Japan side, NIF's machine with 4,000 cores and JEA later with 17,000 cores. So the, the specifications of Helios uh, multiply by 10 the European uh, resources and by five for Japan. So uh, the phases uh, of the project uh, starting in 2007, where uh, first uh, pre-procurement and procurement phase. So from September 2017 to December 2011, the team was built, the needs of the community were explored and the procurement and the construction installation were performed. So you see in the photos from the field it was in 2007 to December 2011 the ready to acceptance complete. So in a bit more detail, our first task was really to clarify the contribution of each party because in agreements, these things are rather vague and uh, we spent some time clarifying who did what and where were the interfaces and so on. Then from mid 2009 to mid 2010, the detailed specifications for the procurement arrangement, which is the the legal instrument to do these contributions. These were prepared and we got particularly input from the users on the needs, expectations. There was a market survey and the codes to do the benchmarking were selected. So there were two fusion codes from EU and two fusion codes from Japan. And we also agreed on a model for the exploitation of CSC, the local personnel, the role of the EU and Japan teams, and finally, we signed the famous PA in April 2010. So 
in the procurement phase, Syria made a competitive procurement and Japan had to procure the, the chiller system. They had a, a big problem because the big earthquake that resulted in the Fukushima accident caused delays by sweeping out a number of companies that were near Sendai, but they managed with a month delay to provide everything that was needed. And uh, from March 2011 to December 2012, the machine was assembled, uh, everything was prepared, tested, and in fact, we were ready for operation on the 1st of January 2012 as planned, which is probably a first in the fusion program to be exactly on time. So a bit about the acceptance tests, capacity, capability, and scalability. So uh, Helios did uh, rather well. And on the top of that, uh, the LIMPAC test achieved 1.13 petaflops uh, just on the 22nd of December. So we were a bit biting our nails, but it was done, achieved a creditable 12th post in the top 500 supercomputer classification in June 2012. And from that on, the operation phase started. So it started with three months of lighthouse projects, kind of projects where you dedicate the entire supercomputer resources to, to a couple of to projects, which also serves to tune the machine. And then the cycles for operation started. They were open calls, and I think probably most of the attendees have had programs running on projects running on, on Helios, I suppose. Uh, a good characteristic of Helios was the excellent availability, which went uh, above 95%, uh, more around 98% for the entire period of operation. And you can also see the usage uh, starting around 55% and then going to 95% at the end, which is also a credit for the scheduler and how to run the jobs. So in terms of upgrades, there was an addition of advanced partition in 2014, uh, conventional nodes a bit later, and one year before the, the end of operation, we added advanced, uh, an advanced partition of NVIDIA GPU to allow users also to start to adapt their codes for future, future operating systems. So the operation ended in 2016. So for the amateurs, a bit of the details of what was installed and of the configuration. Uh, but, okay. I'll say now a few words about phase three, which is after the dismantling. So this is the phase in, in, in which we are to some extent. So uh, at the beginning of 2017, the dismantling took place, it took three, three months. And in, after that, a small partition was uh, conserved and uh, transferred to Japan to bridge the gap before they obtain their new JFRS-1, the Japanese machine, right now. And at the same time, Europe went to Marconi phase one, two petaflops to six petaflops, and then in 2019, to Marconi phase two. So the broader approach uh, agreement, uh, phase one ended formally in 2020, as far as the, the credit, the, the budget was concerned. And there was a negotiation to extend the VA to a VA phase two. So this started in April 2020. We are now then in the first year of VA phase two. And uh, an IFARC HPC working, follow up working group was created to do a number of activities, among which the discussion of a possible joint supercomputer uh, from 2022, again in Rokasho probably, and uh, more of it uh, later. So coming back to the operation, 
this is the, the first call for projects. Uh, I show the distribution of the proposals received. So uh, this was very much maintained then uh, in the five following calls. And as you see, uh, most of the, I mean, the biggest user is uh, plasma turbulence people. And not only in number of projects, as you see on the left-hand side, but also uh, and particularly in the usage of resources that they occupy half of the resources of the, the machine. Having said this, there was also an important part dedicated to React materials, React of technology, and then uh, the other fields of plasma physics and integrated modeling that did grow a bit during the operational period. So, oops, sorry. Regarding the scientific results, well, here I'm not going to go into detail, but um, as uh, colleagues, uh, let us have some beautiful pictures of their projects. The turbulence being the super users comes first, so you can see uh, graphic, graphic representations of results obtained for uh, orb 5 area, or gene simulations, uh, Gene Global and Gisela. Uh, then results uh, for uh, transport, fast particles, as you can see here. If you if you can download the the talk, there are some movies, but I don't dare do thing anything like that from Japan now. So it's there if you wish to see it. Then uh, edge physics, uh, as Alberto was mentioning earlier, for ITER, for instance, and uh, MHD. And now, uh, also, we, we reserved part of the, of the resources for uh, demo, uh, in demo interesting uh, projects. So uh, here are also uh, results from materials. Uh, this is radiation damage in beryllium in demo reactor conditions. So, apart from that, I would like to say a few words of the bits that are not seen so often. So, uh, as an FOE person, there was also uh, usage of the, the HPC resources in direct support of urgent inter construction issues. So. Uh, for instance, here you can see one that was, uh, uh, again, usage of JORIC by Marina, but in this case, it was to uh, calculate, uh, I mean, get the figures needed for the definition of the ITER internal coils and the NFOE procurement. And uh, next to that, uh, Newton flux uh, in the diagnostic shield module. So these are direct inputs for procurement and for fabrication. So Neutronics has been, in a for at least, a very big user of these resources. I mean, not in terms of resources, but in terms of the frequency. And it's mainly uh, our analysis and codes group that perform these electronics and fluid dynamics simulations. So then uh, you can see, uh, Newton flux for, for the shield, uh, uh, nuclear uh, vacuum vessel nuclear heat calculations, also using HPC, and uh, some pretty plots for 3D visualization of excessive neutron streaming for uh, an interdiagnostic generic upper port plug. So, Apart from that, also uh, it was used for electromagnetic calculations, and uh, there not only Helios has been used, but our colleagues have also used Mare Nostrum and uh, Marconi. So I just wanted to highlight also the usage uh, for, for the real construction issues before we arrive to the beautiful plasma physics problems uh, that Alberto referred to early on. So I come here more or less to the conclusions. Uh, Helios has been, I think, a very useful tool for the two fusion communities. 
the impact can be seen by the number of, of uh, refereed papers, which in the lifetime of Helios has gone up to 639 publications. You can see on the left hand side the progress over time, so how the number of papers versus cycle increased, and this shows only the three first cycles, but it went on linearly like this. And uh, finally, I'll say a bit of the outlook for the CSC in BA phase two. So currently, uh, we don't, okay, we, we, are, we have the JFRS one supercomputer by, uh, in the terms of the agreement for BA phase two, uh, the, the Japanese are providing half of the computer resources for broader approach. So it means a quarter of it is accessible to the European scientists as well. And this is for two years, so 2020 and 2021. So for the first year, what we did was to allocate uh, resources to uh, projects that in Europe had already been uh, proposed uh, for, for other platforms and uh, according to the priorities given to us, which are to support ITER simulations, to support uh, JT60 work, and to support also demo simulations. So this has been for the first year. For the second year, we will probably do an open call like Helios in the old times. And the, the group currently working in CSC is also contributing to the reflections on this possible joint supercomputer to be operated starting in 2022-2023. Consistently, we expect the lifetime of the current machines in Europe. So uh, Eurofusion, its General Assembly has established an expert group with a mandate to uh, study whether there is really an advantage to have uh, part of the computing resources for the next period in Japan. And of course, this would be, uh, okay, the deal we propose is that Japanese would cover all the operation costs in Japan, so it would have some advantage. And then also uh, an advantage of having access, if possible, to a Fugaku type of machine uh, for the EU workers. And apart from that, also in, in Japan, similar discussions are taking place. So we expect to have some, some kind of go ahead or not around uh, the first quarter of next year. So um, this is it for me. Thank you very much for your attention. And I, I would like, of course, to thank uh, our team in CEA, QST, the bull people that provided a lot of things, uh, and of course, the rest of the CSC teams. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Susanna. Um, it was fantastic that the connection worked so well. I mean, I was a little bit worried from Japan. Uh, when I'm surprised. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very nice. Um, well, the chat is again open, I believe for everybody's questions. While we wait for the questions, let me ask some something. So you mentioned uh, the next phase that there are discussions going on for a new supercomputer. Do you have any timeline for this? How, how long project would it be? I mean, what, what is the status of these discussions, basically? Yeah, this, what, uh, okay. What we are proposing to the two sides, because the, the working group under CSC is to start the procurements in parallel, both in Japan and in Europe, because uh, I think that the timing is such that in both cases, whether you go jointly or whether you don't, you have to start at the beginning of next year with pre-procurement activities. So what we are proposing is to have on both sides uh, put options to what you want to buy. So if, for instance, the, the, we, there has been a survey of the needs of the European users and it comes out that uh, the, the need in Europe is about a factor of five 
higher than in Japan, just because of the size of the modeling communities. So the proposal would be to have a, a, a machine which would be cover one fifth of the European needs in Bokasho and uh, the rest in Europe. So if you start the procurement in Europe, you can ask for options uh, saying, okay, I would buy either four fifths or the, the whole of the resources I need and then see how it progresses and ask our Japanese colleagues to go similarly and put a number of checkpoints and a precise, in a precise timetable uh, to then decide or propose to the two parties whether it's uh, acceptable to go together or not. So in any case, uh, we plan to continue the collaboration in, in exchanging information, exchanging good practice, etc. But it would be quite exciting to have another machine here, <laughs> particularly under my watch. <laughs> so. Yeah, I completely agree with you. That's an that's, that's exciting prospect, basically. Um, how about, um, do you have any plans about the architecture of this, these machines? Or, I mean, would it be sort of many, many different architecture so do you have a preference already in mind i think uh, the survey to the two communities established that for instance in europe there was a, a lot more appetite for accelerated um, computing resources uh, in japan they were not too interested for the next uh, machine on the other hand if we provide them, they, they are interested in trying in a small scale, and in particular, if, if it's not too onerous for them. So already now in the in broader approach, we have a, a small collaboration project where uh, Eurofusion provides accelerated resources uh, of, uh, from uh, Marconi to Japanese uh, projects, and these have already started or are starting so that they can test their interest and so on. So in general, the Japanese themselves want to keep their option, all their options open. And I, they, they are not sure they want a Fukaku kind of machine, for instance. Uh, but uh, I think uh, you would have to ask the experts here. <laughs> I think on the European side, there is a clearer idea of yeah. what this would be. Okay, thank you. But I'm wondering, um, is the chat functioning at the moment? Because I don't see any any question coming. I'm just a little bit. Is this rose around? Yes, it should be enabled. Let me let me talk. Okay. Yeah, it's it's working. So perhaps everybody <laughs> everybody is happy with Susanna's uh, clear presentation. No questions. Um, more than. Um, let me think. Um, so, broader approach. Can, can you give us a little bit of? I mean, what what are the activities exactly that go under broader approach? Just for our understanding. I understand there's JT60 SA, right? But what what other other ingredients? JT60 SA in this moment is doing machine commissioning, and they. Uh, they have assembled everything. They are cooling the coils, the superconducting coils, and they are uh, they are okay, ready to start uh, to have a, a first plasma around March, between March and June, I think. So in, the, in this case, okay, we have uh, to suffer a bit the COVID issues here. And uh, this is, okay. Uh, a project where Eurofusion also participates by sending personnel, so uh, the European scientists will be able to, to come, operate, and we, IFERC, are also collaborating with JT60 in all the matters of remote access, uh, remote participation, so we want to, to uh, help particularly all the European uh, physics community to have reasonably something like what they used to have with JET, hopefully, and 
this takes a bit of uh, a bit of an effort because the culture for remote access in QST is quite different. Then uh, there is the If Me Veda project. This is uh, here in Rukasho, and it's the construction of a prototype accelerator for uh, uh, a future If Mif. So uh, there also we have a, a very good collaboration with Eurofusion uh, because they they have the Donis part of the of future neutron source work package. They are sending people to collaborate here in the in. Okay, in this case, the accelerator is there. It's uh, being operated. It's going to be upgraded, and it's going to be the basis for the the design of the, the Donis machine that is planned to be built at some point in Granada. And uh, finally, uh, there is us IFERC. So we have a, a a very big activity now in remote participation. We are going to collaborate with ITER organization, testing their uh, applications to give uh, ITER parties remote access to data, etc. So there are a number of things we can already do from here. We have a remote control room for ITER. We have, we have already a, a program of collaboration. Uh, the demo activities continue in bit of a slow burner, but this is a 100% contribution from the Eurofusion activities, so exchange of data with the Japanese demo program and discussions and some joint work as well. And they are also users for simulations. And then uh, finally, uh, the CSC, uh, the Computing, Computational Simulation Center, which in this moment, uh, we are managing these resources provided by Japan under for fir the first two years of, of phase two. And after that, we will see if we, we go for another machine or if the, the, the activity scales down. So we have a, one question from the audience. Xavier Saez from our group, Fusion Group, asks, do you think Fusion community is prepared use the new GPU architectures that are installed in the new supercomputers? Pardon me, I, I lost the sound for a moment. Uh, so can you read the, I mean, in the chat, we have a question. Do you think Fusion communities prepare to use the new GPU architectures that are installed in new supercomputers? What, what is your feeling <laughs> about this topic? Well, I, I've, I'm not an expert, I have to say. How, uh, from what I hear, there are some, some, it's always a big effort to port your beloved code to a new, a, a new platform entirely. So uh, to help that, this is why in Helios, we installed these GPU uh, partitions early on uh, and so on. So, I, I don't know. I think they have to tell us the willingness to, to, to do these steps. I think the, the high level support team in, in Garching does a very good work of helping people to do this kind of exercise. Uh, but of course, I think people have to balance uh, the urgency of doing certain calculations with the, the desirability of uh, stopping and trying and adapting an entire code to a new platform and see how it works. I don't, I don't think I can answer more than this. I agree, it's a difficult question actually um, to answer. Well, I, I think we are all happy with this. Um, this uh, I don't see any more questions. And, uh, so um, I, I, have a, I have a comment on this. Okay, Actually, that, that's a short comment. Actually, the calculations which I showed of the fast particles being lost under the diverter dome and heating in pipes, this is done with GPUs. Because for this type, I, I think we should, uh, and, uh, and the same thing, some of the calculations which I showed regarding the, the heat loads on the first wall, etc. Some of them are done with GPU. So I think for some of the, I would say, physics engineering interface where you want to calculate things on, 
on uh, designs of components with CAD resolution. This is an area where I think uh, GPUs have a lot of, of, of promise. Because the, the physics calculation tend to run not in GPUs, but when you start to do like, you know, detailed, um, uh, you know, losses of particles on components to the centimeter level, I think our conventional codes don't run so well. So I think this is an area that, uh, that I think maybe is an area for future development where the physics engineering interface comes. Thanks a lot, Albert, on this. Actually, this is one of the topics that I would have loved to ask you more details about, Albert, and your talk. Perhaps you could a little bit uh, expand on your comments. So to, how, how do you see this physics engineering and interface overall in future? Well, I mean, the needs, yeah. needs are there, but I mean, what do you have vision? How do you address this? This is an important topic when we start to design demo. Well, what we, what we are trying to do actually is to have this, uh, this interface data structure, which is the wall, for instance, for the wall, where you can do in rather detailed 3D walls. And we are at the moment using it for a number of physics uh, calculation, uh, detailed physics calculation that use supercomputers, like as I was showing the fast particle losses in detail to the specific areas of the, of the wall. Also for... Um, for erosion redeposition. Erosion redeposition is a typically 3D problem. So now with Aero, the new version of Aero by Julie, you, you need to go to this level of detail. Uh, for the elm control coils, of course, uh, this is an area where when you want to calculate the uh, impact of these lobes on the world, since the world is 3D, you have to use it. So I think, as I said, this, this area of the of the detail interface between the physics and the engineering is an area where I think is uh, now we can import, uh, you know, CAD models, sort of um, uh, de-refine them because sometimes they are, and then put them as as input into into codes. And I think this is an area where the GPUs have quite a lot of promise. And this is where we use them, to be fair, at the moment. We bought some some uh, small. Uh, I mean, <laughs> in Italy we don't have a lot of computer resources, unlike you. So we bought few. <laughs> few GPUs to do this, but uh, I see, I see, a, a, I mean, I, for instance, just this is when, when you compare calculations with ASCOT or with, uh, with um, the, the, the Japanese code that follows fast particles, I don't remember now the name, OFM, I think it is, then the, the, the problem is that this, these codes calculate very well um, the the particle losses and the momentum loss and the energy loss, but if you start to go to details of impact on a specific part of the components, the the, the simulation time becomes enormous because they are not thought like that. And this is, I think, where for for some of these uh, particle following code, this, since this is a typical thing that they do for computer graphics, for this type of work, GPUs are, are optimized, and you do many, many more and much faster simulations. Thanks, thanks okay. for, for this input. We also have a comment from Maria Jose Caturla, sort of reinforcing that in the case of materials, there are already some codes that use GPUs. Okay. Definitely. This is the area where I see a lot of, uh, for things that you follow particles, this is an area where I think we should really do it because, as I said, uh, to go to the, for instance, this locus simulation require these pipes that I showed are centimeter pipes. So you have to calculate impact of particles in centimeter. If you want to do this with a conventional Monte Carlo, it's impossible. Okay, I think, well, shall we, shall we stop the discussion here? I want to thank Susanna and Alberta for your talks. It was really interesting this morning session. Now it would be time for this, um, this photo, <laughs> group photo. So if Susanna, you would um, unshare your slides and everybody who wants to participate in this group photo, just turn on yes, your so. videos and Rose will guide us through to this, <laughs> this uh, photo opportunity. Yes, so, okay, so turn on your cameras if you want to be in the photo. 
and uh, it might take take some time because I would have to take several photos. Okay, S smile. One more final one. Okay, that's it. Thank you so much, Rose, and thank you, everybody. Um, basically, now it's time for a small break, just to stretch our legs. So, um, and then after the break, please, well, uh, try, try, well, before, before the uh, start of the next session, because we will split into rooms. Um, so that um, for the, for the parallel session, uh, room one, this is the same one as we are using now. And then, um, in this uh, room, there will be Jeronimo Garcia's uh, Yashura Sushovis and E.R. Olot's talks. And the ones um, who want to follow the talks by Maria Jose Caturla, uh, Javier Juan Rubia, and Prasha Tiveri would need to move during this break to our parallel session room, too. And uh, we will start at 10.55 sharp. Yeah. See you. See you soon. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, welcome to the session. My name is uh, Shinpei Futatani. Uh, I will chair of this session. So we have to respect the timekeeping, especially in this kind of video conference. Uh, I behave like Japanese train, very punctual. So uh, in this Spanish conference, so let's get started now. Invited contributions are 20 minutes talk and five minutes discussion. So speakers, please uh, keep, it this, keep this mind. Uh, I will give a platform to Dr. Hanon Mugartia, uh, Sewa Kadarash, Hans. So Hanon, uh, please start your talk. Yes. Uh, should I share my screen? Yeah, can you share it? Yes, one moment. Thanks. Okay. Wait a second. Okay. Now, can can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. So uh, I can start. Yes, please. So, good morning to everybody. So uh, this uh, contribution about fast ions and the source of transport suppression in jet plasmas. And then um, this is a, it's a long story as you're going to see, and it's a very successful story from the HPC point of view. So uh, 
I'm going to explain this story in a chronological order. And this is the motivation for this outline. So we'll start with the origins, the initial HPC analysis, about nonlinear electromagnetic and fast time effects, experimental validation, searching for physical mechanisms, closing the loop with ITER, and in the end, conclusions. So the origins of the studies of uh, fast ions on transport are uh, a uh, very long time ago. And I'm going to give uh, three motivations. The first motivation came from JET, and this, this experiment you can see here. This was an experiment in which there was a significant reduction of ion temperature profile stiffness, which is defined as the local normalized ion flux gradient with respect to the normalized temperature gradient when the MBI and SRH were high. So you here basically see two curves. In blue is a curve in which it is a low power, and you see that the flux increase very fast with the small changes of temperature gradient. And another one in red in which you get the same level of fluxes, but a very high temperature gradients. This at the beginning was supposed to happen because when you increase the MBI power, you increase the rotation of the plasma. And we thought at that time that everything was coming from A cross B shear. The second motivation is coming from uh, another observation related to the main scenarios. As you know, we can divide the main plasma scenarios in three. In, a, in H mode, in inductive, hybrid, and steady state. So the main difference you can see clearly here in these two graphs, one is the pressure, another one is the Q profile for the different scenarios. But the background of all this, there was a, a third element which was a little bit mysterious, which was the change of uh, polyadial current from the equilibrium, as you can see here. For the inductive was purely positive, for the hybrid was mostly flat, and for the steady state was negative. So this uh, shows that there is a reversal from paramagnetic to damagnetic plasmas when you change the type of a scenario. And this shows that, that there is the role of polar current and beta polyether. And you may wonder why this is important for fast ions, where the third observation came from JET as well, from a hybrid scenario in which you see here that the, the beta is very high, beta polyether, beta N, and the H factor was very high at high MBI power. And the observation was that actually, um, in order to get this type of a scenario, you significantly requires a high pressure gradient in this region here in blue. And this, uh, this for instance, this hybrid scenario matches very well what you would expect from zero polyadal current. So zero polyadal current means significant high pressure gradients precisely here. But precisely here, as you can see in this graph, the fast ion pressure gradient was very high. So it seems that at least a jet, in order to get very high pressure and pressure gradient, one key ingredient was the significant fast ion pressure gradient. So these three main motivation uh, drove uh, a significant study on, with HPC analysis on the role of these fast ions, if there was any role, because we didn't know at that time. So now I'm going to go to the main analysis uh, the initial ones, which were uh, carried out with the gene code. Gene, you know, is an Eulerian gyrokinetic code, which treats uh, kinetically all the species, including the fast ions, as you are going to see, include electromagnetic fluctuations, which are very important. You have collisional operators, you have the external exhibit here as well. We usually use the initial values for linear simulations. You can include realistic equilibrium, which we did. In all these simulations I'm going to show, uh, they are all local flux tube, which are justified for, for jet at least in the core. And you can use both Maxwellian and uh, non-Maxwellian distribution functions, although most of the work I'm going to show here was done for Maxwellian distribution function. So if I go to uh, the first set of analysis, this was done for L-mod plasmas, the, the first slide you have seen. And as I said before, we all expected the uh, cross B shear to play a role because we know that this is a good mechanism to quench uh, turbulence. And you see here the initial, initial results were not encouraging. You see here the, the flux uh, with respect to the temperature gradient. And if you include, uh, you include X B shearing without including the parallel velocity gradient, the stabilization, what you get is a shift of this stiffness curve but you don't recover at all these results from JET. Even worse, when you include the PVG, you are not even close to these results from JET. So you never get this low stiffness curve. 
So what we learned from here is that rotation shear was not playing a role in these plasmas, which was a surprise. So next step, after some time, it took some time to realize that there was uh, an ingredient missing. And this ingredient missing was the level of fast ions on these plasmas, which increased significantly with increasing power. When you include these fast ions in your simulations and you at the same time also include the electromagnetic effects, what happens is the following. You see this point here without any of those ingredients. And when you put, you go down here which is very close to experimental values for the heat flux. So we start to see that you needed two ingredients to match the fluxes and to match this low stiffness scope. One was the electromagnetic effects and another one, the fast ions from the heating systems. And um, what we call this was uh, stabilization by electromagnetic effects and by non-linear effects, because what we saw is that non-linearly this reduction with fast ions and beta was much higher than linear stabilization. This is another example from an HMO plasma, as the hybrid scenario you have seen before. This is first a linear simulation in which you see in black a simulation with fast ions and electrostatic simulation. Then we put electromagnetic effects. You see in blue how this is significantly reduced. And in the end, you put fast ions and you get these red curves here. So linearly, you also see a reduction of growth rate when you include uh, uh, finite beta and fast ions. But also what happens is that if you are not careful, you might develop some low KY modes, which are fast ion modes. And um, this was actually not observed in the, in the plasma itself, experimental. So this was a kind of mystery as well, why we saw reduction of uh, turbulence and development of these fast ion modes, but in the experiment, we didn't see the fast ion modes. If we go to um, non-linear simulations, you see very similarly to what happened in the L mode. Here is the red curve uh, without fast ions and electromagnetic effects, but you put the fast ions, you see that there is some reduction of the heat flux, not as much as in the L mode because the level of fast ions in each mode was lower because of the higher density. But in any case, you see that there is a significant reduction when you go to high gradient of temperature when you include the fast ions. In order to get close to experimental data, you both need the electromagnetic effects and the fast ions. The importance of beta is shown here. If we have a simulation without fast ions and with 5% lower beta, and you see that the, the heat flux significantly increases with only 5% lower beta. So these two ingredients are extremely important to explain why we have uh, transport reduction and turbulence suppression in, in jet plasmas with significant amount of power. As I said before, um, you have to be careful a little bit with all this. This is a, a simulation, the same simulation you have seen before, but uh, in two phases. In one phase in which uh, we have reduced artificially the, the fast ion pressure gradient by 30% because otherwise to develop the fast ion modes, which are not seen in the experiment. And if you do that, the fluxes are very low, which is very good. But if you don't reduce the fast ion pressure gradients, what happens is what happens here in the second phase, you have an extreme level of uh, heat flux for all the species fast ion or thermal species, which is not uh, experimental valid. These fluxes are really too high and it was not seen in the experiment. So here we have something, as I said before, kind of a mystery. The fast ions are playing a role on reduction of the turbulence, but once you reach KVM or fast ion modes, you get something unphysical. So it was a matter of doubt whether uh, these results were okay or not. So the next step was indeed experimental validation because you have uh, found this with HPC, it was very nice, but how to know if it is true? Well, there was a new experiment, as you can see here, it's a bit later, there was a new experiment in JET in which the same type of experiment you have seen for the L mode was done, but uh, at reducing the MBI power. So just trying to do with only a SRH and then you have much less rotation in the plasma. So basically, I'm not going to comment all this graph. Basically, what was obtained was exactly the same. So when you go to very high SRH power, the level of stiffness is reduced. And gene simulations show again that when you include, in this case, the fast helium-3 for the SRH, 
you have significant level of reduction of transport, as you can see here. And if you include the electromagnetic effects even more, and then you get very close to experimental levels. So this was a final demonstration that fast tidings are playing a role for transport reduction, and it was not the increase be shielding in this particular case. So this was a very nice validation of the simulation. But of course, one key point was why this happens. What is the physics behind all this? This was uh, studied a little later, as you can see in this paper here, by using the same L-mold plasma as you have seen before. And then uh, the results were very uh, interesting, actually. So this was uh, what was seen is that the linearly marginally stable TA modes uh, can be non-linearly excited by the IPV and develop TAE modes. So this, uh, at some point you can see here, this, uh, these are different plasmas from Manjet and also as upgrade. And you see that the some small peaks here, which are on the TA regime. These are very small peaks. So um, you see on this only non-linearly because linearly was stable. So this fast ion mode furthermore start to increase and affect the zone of flow levels. And the increase of uh, zone of flow levels strongly suppress heat and particle fluxes and reduce the TAE drive. So th this is what was found in these particular cases. And you see how important uh, is beta here because it depends on the level of beta, the small peak for the TAE can become very, very high. The problem, as I said before, is that um, the role of zone of flows, TAE, this is, was very nice, but as I said before, TAE were never observed in these plasmas. So how to be sure that this is the real mechanism behind all this? And in addition, uh, to know whether the TAE are playing a role or not is very important for it as well. And why is important for it? So then this is going to be my last point. It's important for it because of the following. It was also uh, some simulations for the expected eta plasmas. And then, as you can see here, see plasmas in DT are expected to be significantly different to DD. You see here this simulation also made with gene in which the fluxes in DD and DT, they are different. In particular, in DT, they are lower than in DD. But in DT, if you include the contribution from the fast ions, mainly from the alphas, you see a significant reduction of flux. So we could expect that the alphas in ether will reduce turbulence. However, the problem is uh, how to validate this in experimental conditions, because the experimental ether conditions are quite different to the plasmas you have seen before. You need mostly electron heating, MEF ions, maybe in the alphas, uh, plasmas TI equal to TE, low rotation, and why not alpha most destabilization? Because we expect that to happen in ether by the alphas. So how to get these plasmas? As you can see here, the plasmas we have seen before, and this is a summary, they are very different to what we expect in ITA. In particular, the density of fast ions, the temperature of the fast ions, and even the electron beta. So um, the problem was how to reach plasmas which are closer to this last row here, which is what we would expect in ITA. So in general, there is a two steps problem. The first one is to produce these very highly energetic ions in deuterium as a first assessment. And the second one will be to check in DT in the end. So there was a new experiment very recently in JET with the new ICRH scheme called the three ion scheme. And in a mixture of deuterium and helium three plasmas. And this, in this new experiment, you see by comparison to what we expect in the hybrid scenario that we are much closer to the fast ions we expect there. In particular, the density is lower of fast ions and the temperature of fast ions is much higher. And even if it is L mode, electron beta is not low, it's not so low at all. So in these new experimental conditions is where um, we expect to see something closer to what we expect in either by the alphas. And the surprises obtained uh, and the results obtained were very, very surprising. So with this isolated scheme, you see that you fully develop TAE modes, as you can see here, and also reverse Alvin modes. So you have many, many Alvin modes. And at the same time, there is a surprise on what happens to the temperatures. Uh, we have here a comparison between um, the plasma with only MBI in blue 
and a plasma with a small amount of MBI and ICRH with MEF ions with the same total input power in pink. So look at the temperatures. Since the MEF ions are so energetic, they mostly heat the electrons, and then you get more, uh, high electron heating, much higher than that with only MBI, because with the MBI, you heat most, mostly the ions. So this is normal, this is okay. What is not so clear is this part here, because the ion temperature is also higher when you heat mostly the electrons. So how is this even possible? How is the ion temperature going to increase when you exchange ion heating by electron heating? It's not only this. The point is the point is that in the end you get a beta confinement with uh, electron heating rather than the ion heating, and you get beta confinement with TAE than without TAE because in the MBI only there is no TAE. So there was uh, an extension of the studies you have seen previously, but in these new results from then in which it was analyzed what mechanisms behind these uh, new results with improved confinement with TA. So what you see here is again simulations with gene, but including these very, very energetic ions. And then you see that when these ions are not included, and this is the thermal diffusivity dependence on the fast ion pressure gradient, in the shadow regions, uh, the results without fast ion, you see that diffusivity is very, very high, both for helium-3 and deuterium. When the fast ion pressure gradient is very low, you get something very similar to the case with alpha ions. But when you reach a point in which the TAE is marginally destabilized here or fully destabilized here, the electrostatic heat flux is suppressed, fully suppressed. That means that you are developing an IGB from the electrostatic heat flux. So this only happens when you have the alumina. So we can say that the fast ion energy is channeled through zonal activity to thermal ions. And this happens because in you see in this figure, and this is my last slide, I will finish soon. You see in this figure that the case without fast ions, you see the typical uh, eddies going in the radial direction, but when you put the fully destabilized TAE, you get the strong zonal flows for the electrostatic potential here, but also happens for the electromagnetic potential. This is without fast ions and it is with fast ions, which means that both electrostatic and electromagnetic transport are very much suppressed because of the development of this TAE. This is a very important result because and we could have something similar with the alphas in DT. And that is what is going to be a, a priority in the following Jet DT campaign, which will happen in 2021. So if I go to my conclusions, the fast ion impact on turbulence and uh, jet has been a story of success because HPC has driven research towards new discoveries. So the main uh, bottom line from all this is that fast ions can significantly reduce or even suppress turbulence. Uh, and in this context, I would say that gyrogenetic theory has been proven to be correct, and at least in its domain of applicability. And also something extremely important is that the interplay between experiments, modeling, and HPC is essential to understand and predict future plasmas. We have seen how HPC has found something new, but the final validation has to come from experiment because otherwise people maybe don't believe. And they expected that uh, we expect that alpha particles from DT reactions to play a role on transport and turbulence. And the first assessment of this uh, new physics will come from the jet DT campaign to happen next year. So if you are interested in this, just come to us and let's see together. So that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your interesting talk. So let's start discussion for five, yeah, five minutes. Um, there are some uh, posts in chat already <coughs> from uh, Marion Smeldberg. Um, he, she says, if she, her question is, if man, electromagnetic effects are important, I'm wondering what this means for electrostatic codes such as qualities. I saw you had a number of uh, Jonathan uh, Citrin's citation. Yeah, I can, I can answer to that very easily. Um, even in quality case, there is a, a mock-up of this effect, which was uh, uh, deduced from jet data. 
But this mock-up, of course, is not based on first principle results. It's just a mock-up. But I, I'm aware very well that they are working on having a new version of quality keys with electromagnetic effects because precisely of these results. From the point of view of TGLF, I know that they have the electromagnetic effects, of course, but the role of fast ions inside the code is not so simple. So uh, from the quasi-linear theory, they are working hard to get these results on those, uh, on those models. Thanks. I hope it's fine. Um, another question from uh, Mr. Thomas Highward Schneider. He says, he's asking, how do you expect that the effect of gap noise BAETAs will change if you perform global rather than local modeling? Is it on the hor horizon and or what differences you will find in linear simulations? The fact that um, uh, indeed all this has done with a local simulation because as you see it's a long story from a long time ago. So um, precisely because of that and in this last uh, results with TA we have been very careful to compare some of the results from gene to the measurements in order to be sure that um, frequencies from TA, uh, location of modes and all this uh, is more or less in agreement with experimental data. But of course uh, you cannot really handle all this with local code, you need a global code. Then uh, the problem is that to put all these things in a global code is very complicated. It will take a lot, a lot of time. And then we cannot wait to have a first assessment on this physics, physics if we need to wait for the full global simulation. So that's the reason why we get first these results. But I'm very much aware that many people, including people next to me, are going to work towards global simulation, including all this physics. And this is essential, and this essential work that must be done as well in the framework of JDT, because there is the first step to understand this physics towards it. So we will profit the JDT results to push towards this very expensive global simulation, because they are really essential to fully understand this physics. OK. Uh... This will be the last question from Alberto Duarte. <clears throat> He's asking, um, the question is, the AE MOIS, then AE MOIS interrupt, interrupting extended radio turbulence structures to develop. If this is the case, the difference in the in mode structure between ITER and JET can be important. Is this a comment? Yes, no, I fully agree. The difference between the mode structure in ITER and, and, and JET is evident, so it could play a role. Um, the problem to analyze that point specifically is that we cannot do so many uh, simulations, we cannot do so many scans, and then we cannot really explore all the physics uh, from the HPC point of view because these are very, very expensive simulations. So uh, we are planning to do that. But before planning to do that with local simulations, it would be better to have global simulations, which could address these points as well. But indeed, the structure of the mode is important because the physics you see with the TA is not the same type of interaction, nonlinear interaction with ITG, for instance, with EAE modes. We have EAE modes in the same experiment, and these ones do not interact with ITG, for instance. So the type of mode, the structure of the mode, is very important for nonlinear physics between ITG and TA. So it might happen that in ITA is a bit different, but that this has to be addressed with HPC. Okay, thank you very much. It's time up. Thank so if you. you have more questions, please contact the speaker later by email. Uh, let's proceed to the next talk. Next talk is given by Professor uh, Yasuhiro Suzuki from NIST nice, Japan. So Suzuki-san, uh, please start your talk. Yeah, I can see your screen. Yeah, so thank you very much, Dr. Katani-san. Uh, good night from Japan. So today uh, I want to talk about the nonlinear image dissemination of the core plasma collapse event in stellar So this work 
is done with the collaboration with uh, Futani san. So now that he is chairing this session and also the Yohim Gaiga IPP Grasbout. So this is the contents of the, my talk. So at first, the, I want to give the, some introduction for sterilators and the nonlinear MHD study in sterilators. And then the, uh, let me introduce the, our nonlinear 3D MHD simulation code, MIPS, uh, developing in MIPS. And then the, I want to show the, some of the results of the, our nonlinear MHD study, uh, especially the core temperature pluses in the Bendel Science Level X. And then the, uh, I will summarize the, my talk and give the, some outlooks of the, this study. Okay, so then the uh, so sterilators are alternative for the steady state the fusion reactor. Uh, of course, the tokamak is the first runner for the development of the fusion device, but the sterilator has the many advantages for the steady state operations. So sterilator community has the two flagships. The one is the so-called LHD, the large helical device in our institute in Japan. And second one is, the, as you know, the Bendelstein 7X in Germany. So Bendelstein 7X starts the experiment for recent the few years and quite new and the very interesting uh, experimental results that we observed. So one interesting phenomena uh, we observed in Bendelstein 7X experiment uh, at the beginning of the Bendelstein 7X experiment, so-called OP11, so they tried the ECCD current drive to study the MHD. So they tried, the, for example, the counter ECCD. So counter means the rotational transform the iota in magnetic axis degrees and the core ECCD, so this is opposite the rotational transform of the magnetic axis in degrees. So then the counter ECCD case, the, for example, the, if the, we see the core temperature behavior uh, in the time trend, so as you can see the, some, the small crush appears, but the so very steady state operations that they realized, but the core ECCD case, so as you can see, the some the crush events appear. So then the what happens so in this timing? So that is the main motivation of the, this study. And then the recently, the, this the core crush event studies the more extensively. So then the finally, the, they observe that this crush event is very similar so to crushes in tokamak. So as you can see that this is the time evolution of the heating power and the temperature in the core and the middle of the minor radius, stored energy and the toroidal current and the line integrated density. Uh, so then the, so if the, we see uh, the core temperature behavior, so very small crush appears, but the here, so large crash appeared and then the start of energy the sharply the drop, so like this. And then again, the uh, 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 recovered the start of energy. Again, the here, the crash, the sharp drop appeared like this. So then the, if the, we see uh, the uh, temperature evolution by the ECE measurement, and here is the core region, and here is the edge region. So as you can see, the after the observing the sound of the precursors, so large crash event appeared, so like this. So then the, so if the, how to say that this type, the crash event happens, so what kind of the MHD has a key role to make the, this crash event? So that is the motivation of the, this study. So then the, uh, to study the MHD behavior in sterilators, so we need the true 3D code. So what is the meaning of the true? 
So uh, we know the many, so several the nonlinear energy simulation codes, the, for example, the Joek or the Nimrod and MCBC1 and so on. So then the, those codes the widely applied the 3D tokamak. So in other words, the perturbed tokamak. But the 3D tokamak is not equivalent to the stellarator. So because the stellarator is the intrinsically a 3D configuration. So that is not weak symmetry breaking. So then the, to consider the nonlinear MHB behavior, of course, the linear behavior including, so toroidal mode coupling is a key issue. So because the, to study the nonlinear MHB, so we need the 3D equilibrium. So then the, all the MHB behavior strongly couple the 3D equilibrium. So then the mode family appears. So like this, the mode family, it can be defined like this, and the NFP is the toroidal field periodicity. So then the Bendelstein 7x case, the toroidal field periodicity is five, and the LHD, the toroidal field periodicity is 10. So then the, let's consider the N equal one mode family. So if the, we accord, if we follow the, this uh, definition, so uh, how to say that if the N equal one mode family consider for LHD, so we need to consider the six, the mode family. And so Bendelstein seven X case, the field of is five and the three mode family that we need to consider. So anyway, so for stellarator study, so we need the wide area, wide region of the mode space the definitely needed. And then the, if the, we compare the tokamak nonlinear study, so usually tokamak codes are initialized by the 2D equilibrium. So that means the equilibrium is n equals zero component only half. So that case, the equilibrium and the instability completely decouple. So in such a case, the tokamak is uh, very simple comparing with the stellarator analysis. So this allows the independent mode analysis. So because so decoupling of the equilibrium, so then the n equal one, only the n equal two, only the n equal three possible in particular the linear mode analysis. And also the for tokamak, so generally the 2D system, so flux surface function two psi can be defined. So that means uh, uh, this allows the reduced models or can be used. So then the in tokamak nonlinear model, so usually the calculate the nonlinear behavior of the proidal flux and the vorticity and the pressure and so on. But, uh, and also the, if the, we use the reduced model for 2D FEM and the Fourier expansion along the toroidal direction can be widely used. But uh, unfortunately the for stellarator, so general 3D configuration, full 3D set of the MHD equations must be solved. So we cannot use the flux surface function. We definitely need to calculate the magnetic field vectors. So then the, uh, to study the stellarator nonlinear behavior, uh, we are developing the extended MHD code, the so-called MIPS. Uh, so MIPS code uh, use the uh, no extended MHD model uh, developed by the header time, so like this. And then the, this is uh, in principle, the nonlinear dissipative the MHD model, including the term, the extended the MHD model. So especially the uh, toroidal diamagnetic rotation like this. But the, in this study, uh, so to study the step-by-step, so at first, the, we switched off the extended energy term, the colloidal diamagnetic rotation for ion, and also the, we didn't include the source term. And the dissipation uh, profile, the, especially the uh, resistivity, the eta, and the viscosity nu, uh, profile shape is fixed in time and the space, and also the fixed boundary condition is used 
And also the MHD equilibrium is initialized by the hint code. So, and then the, let us the introduce the numerical scheme of the MIPS code. So, MIPS code uses the fourth order finite difference scheme and also the time integration. Uh, we didn't use the implicit scheme. So, we use the high order explicit the fourth order longitude scheme. And also the interesting point is the coordinate system. So in stellarators, so magnetic island and the stochastic field frequently appear. So in such a case, the very sophisticated the flux coordinate system uh, usually makes the many, many difficulties. So then the to simulate the nonlinear behavior without the difficulties depending on the magnetic topology. So we adopt the Eulerian grid. That is the cylindrical coordinates, the R by Z. But the, of course, if the, we adopt the, these, the numerical scheme, so of course the explicit scheme needs the very tire, small the time step. And also the, if the, we see that this the model configuration, uh, of course, that we need very fine grid spacing. But the, this the explicit scheme and the finite difference scheme, the very fast and the very robust. So that is the one advantage comparing with the other nonlinear matrix codes. And then the MIPS code successfully applies the nonlinear matrix study for LHD. The, for example, the these results are the, our paper in last year. So we demonstrate the pellets injected drive the nonlinear MHD in LHD. So if the how to say the we inject the ice pellet from here to the plasma core, uh, density perturbation driven by the ice pellet excite the nonlinear MHD behavior. So then the, as you can see the clear the two one pellet cloud forms. So like this inside the plasma. And then the interesting point is that if the, we don't inject the pellet into the plasma, so this plasma is very stable. But the, if the, we increase the size of the pellet, so in other words, the number of the molecular, so as you can see, the strong, the nonlinear MHD are excited, so like this. And also the in LHD, so we observe the sharp drop of the core density after the pellet injection are uh, observed. So if the, we study the nonlinear behavior uh, in MIPS code, so as you can see, so pellet injection, after the pellet injection, the strong the pressure gradient excites the ballooning mode. So then the, that ballooning mode breaks the magnetic field topology and then the pressure diffuse along the stochastic magnetic field line, and then the core pressure drop, so like this. So this the nonlinear MHD simulation result are quite consistent to the experimental observation. So then the, let's move on the Bender Science X study. So at first, the, we studied the 3D MHD equilibrium by the hint code. So configuration is the standard configuration, so we assume the simple the parabolic uh, profile in real space, or so in other words, uh, the linear function in flux space. And to model the ECCD, so we assume the very localized the current density profile, so like this. So then the in, without the ECCD case, so by the way, the beta is very low, but the, we induce the very localized current density profile like this. So without ECCD case, so as you can see, the clear flux surface forms are kept in finite beta equilibrium, but the, with ECCD case. So as you can see, so here, a small island chain appeared. So this is the zoom up figure. So here, the small island chain appeared. So in such a case, the what happened? 
So if the, we study the rotational transform profile the, with ECCD case, so dark blue and the orange or vacuum and the without ECCD case, and the green, the 10 kilo ampere ECCD, the brown is a 15 kilo ampere and the purple is a 16 kilo ampere. So as you can see, if the ECCD is larger than the 15 kilo ampere, so rotational transform across the IO type one, so then the here, because the rotational transform across the one, so then the five over five magnetic island appear. So then the, this, uh, the behavior uh, strongly affects the nonlinear MHD and also the here, so hatched region, so magnetic shear is uh, almost zero. And then the, this the very weak shear strongly affects the nonlinear MHD. And then the, at first, the linearized the MIPS code that we developed, so then the linear growth rate study. So then the, this is the time evolution of the kinetic energy without the ECCD and the, with ECCD. So if the, we compare the linear growth rate, in other words, the time evolution of the kinetic energy, so with ECCD case, so obviously are larger than the without the ECCD case. And also that we see uh, the mode structure of the pressure perturbation so as you can see, so weak shear region, so ballooning-like structure appear. So then the question is that in nonlinear phase, the what happens? So unfortunately, the nonlinear uh, MHD simulation uh, doesn't complete yet, but the already achieved to the saturation phase. So then the in linear phase, so as you can see, so linear mode structure appeared, so like this. But the, this line, so five over five islands appeared. So then the island chain strongly deformed the mode structure of the ballooning mode. And then the, if the, we check the magnetic topology and the pressure distribution in nonlinear phase, so at first the uh, 18, the tau Alben case, so magnetic field, so nonlinear MHD destroy the nested flux surface, so like this, and the pressure distribution deform along the, this the stochastic magnetic field line. And then the, in later phase of the nonlinear evolution, so as you can see, the pressure diffuse along the stochastic magnetic field line, so like this, and then the diffusion of the edge pressure leads the core drop of the plasma pressure. That is the uh, present a hypothesis how to understand the core temperature crash in the Bendelstein 7X. Okay, so then the, this is a brief summary and the outlook. So in this study, the, we simulate the core temperature crash event in the Bendelstein 7X and the localized current density profile the significantly changes the iota profile. And if the ECCD current is larger than the 15 kilo ampere, so iota crosses the unity, so iota equal one, and then the new island chain appears in the plasma core. And then the linear growth rate with ECCD is larger than the case without the ECCD, and the nonlinear phase, the pressure diffuse by the mode. And the magnetic topology that we should study the more systematically. And also the, so uh, MIPS code used the Eulerian coordinate system. So then the, to estimate the mode number. So we need the mode analysis. So that mode analysis that should be examined in future subjects. So that also, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your interesting talk. Let's start discussion for five minutes. I start reading from the first one. A uh, question from, uh, from Marion. Uh, she's asking, I ha had a quick question. Why did you use hint instead of beam mech for the magnetic equilibrium? Are there benefits of using one or the other? Ah, okay, so that is a very 
a uh, quick answer. So VMAC cannot allow the magnetic ion. So then the so point is the point is uh, how to say the change of the magnetic topology and the reaction with the magnetic ion. That is the key. So in such a case that we cannot use VMAC. Okay, thanks. Another question from the Iho Holod. What kind of parallelization is implemented in MIPS? Uh, okay, so uh, in principle, the MIPS code is uh, parallelized by hybrid. Hybrid means the uh, MPI and the OpenMP. So in principle, the uh, so MPI is used the 3D decomposition along the R5G or direction, and also the OpenMP is used the parallelization so in a loop of the uh, uh, how to say the calculations. Okay, thanks. While I wait Alberto's question, I ask uh, the question from Florian. This question is for the nonlinear simulation. How large is the number of degrees of freedom or number of uh, time steps? How large is the number of degree? Ah, uh, so degree is the uh, equations uh, one, three, one, three, and uh, three. So total thirteen or something. So anyway, the full three D set, and also the metric sides. So in this case. Uh, in this case, uh, I use uh, the 512 by 512 for R and the Z direction, and also the 256 grid for toroidal direction. So in this simulation, I assume the toroidal field of periodicity. So then the, I calculate only uh, 72 degree. And also the mesh uh, the time step is uh, roughly uh, 500,000. Okay, thanks. Uh, last question from Alberto. The question is, when they put the pellet, they observe a crash by MHD, but does not the transport change afterwards because of density peaking or does the MHD kill the peaking? Uh, so in this case, the MHD kills the peaking. Okay, thanks. So I think it's time to go to the next session, next uh, talk. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, one minute I have. Is there optimum uh, pellet size? Do you have, do you have an idea, Suzuki-san? Uh, optimum the pellet side. So uh, how to say the uh, optimum pellet size that we have the so three millimeters. My, 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 no, my question was just to clarify because I type it very quickly. So there is an optimum pellet size to get transport improvement, but not MHD triggering. Ah, uh, so transport improvement. Yeah, so. Uh, we didn't uh, we didn't identify the optimum pellet size. So because uh, in LHD case, uh, the quark fury is very difficult. So then the so always excite the MHD in plasma edge. So okay. Then the, we didn't observe that transport improvement. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. So thank you very much. The, let's go to the next uh, talk. Next talk is given by Dr. Iho Holod uh, from Max Planck Computing and Data Facility. So Iho, uh, please start your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you see my slides? Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, so first of all, let me thank the organizers of this workshop for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. 
Uh, the topic of my presentation uh, is more numerical. It's uh, about advanced preconditioner for the nonlinear MHD code JOREC. This work was done in collaboration with uh, Matthias Holtz, Guido Wijsmans, and other members of uh, JOREC developer team. The outline of my presentation is the following. Uh, first, I'll give you some short introduction and motivation to our work. Then I will uh, be talking about uh, JORIC solver in general and uh, preconditioning in particular. Uh, then I will show some uh, numerical benchmarks of the work we have done. And I will summarize with a summary and uh, acknowledgements. So uh, the main motivation of our work is to address uh, large scale magnetohydrodynamic instabilities in tokamak plasmas, uh, which is crucial especially for future large machines like ITER and DEMO. Uh, we can generally distinguish uh, two important class of MHD events, uh, namely disruptions and edge localized modes. The disruptions are the kind of events leading to a sudden loss of confinement, and this can cause plasma energy being expelled to tokamak material walls, which is potentially very damaging for the machine. And edge localized modes are the types of instabilities uh, developed in the plasma edge region. Uh, they can uh, significantly uh, deteriorate uh, the, the performance, and in some cases also cause high transient heat and load on material walls. The numerical simulations uh, of MEG instabilities play a crucial role in improving physical understanding in order to avoid or at least mitigate undesirable uh, MHG activities. Uh, here, let me show you uh, the example of a disruption event via uh, mode locking. So the sequence of events leading to plasma disruption is following. Uh, so first, uh, closed magnetic flux surface uh, get broken with the formation of quasi-static magnetic islands. And then as islands grow, uh, uh, the stochastic magnetic field from overlapping islands cause increased convective transport, leading to a rapid loss of plasma kinetic energy. This is referred to as thermal quench. And then uh, conductivity in cooler plasma is reduced, causing sudden loss in plasma current. And this, of course, leads to rapid increase of inductive toroidal electric field uh, to sustain the current, generating significant accelerating electron current, which can be damaging for tokamak walls. This is referred to as runaway electron current. And additionally, plasma volume becomes uh, vertically unstable due to loss of control. Uh, and uh, the simulation of uh, such um, instability is shown in the, in the figure below. This is uh, coming from simulation by Javier uh, Artola. Uh, numerical simulations uh, for uh, such disruption event are um, needed for better understanding and ultimately to avoid and mitigate the disruption. Uh, another type of undesirable, uh, undesirable MHD instability is edge localized mode, uh, referred to uh, uh, the abbreviation is ELM. So ELMs can uh, lead to formation of edge stochastic magnetic layer, causing increased transport um, and uh, subsequent uh, destruction of uh, plasma pedestal. And this, of course, leads to a degraded performance and also sudden increase of heat and particle fluxes towards plasma facing components. Uh, the numerical simulation of ELMS uh, can provide an uh, estimate of heat load onto diverter targets and the amount of generated impurities. And they can also provide uh, important insight uh, and understanding of ELM evolution, which also allows the development of uh, various mitigation strategies. Uh, so uh, as we can see from demonstrated examples, uh, comprehensive simulations of large scale MHG events must cover a wide range of temporal scales. So uh, the figure shows the evolution of H-mode plasma uh, pedestal uh, 
uh, during uh, uh, Elm uh, crash and the recovery. As you can see, there is a wide range of uh, time scales. And to address numerically uh, such scale separation, we need to use uh, the implicit time integration method. In this work, uh, we focus uh, on the nonlinear uh, MHD code JORIC. It is originally developed at CIA Kadarash and now it's a large European and international project with many users and developers. Uh, as I mentioned, JORIC implements an implicit solver uh, for extended MHD models in realistic 3D geometry, including XPoint. Uh, it employs a two-dimensional finite element formulation based on the on the Bézier elements, and in the periodic toroidal direction, the Fourier decomposition is used. Uh, JORIC is a massively parallel code uh, with uh, hybrid MPI OpenMP parallelization, and currently it undergoes extension to GPU accelerators. Uh, with fully implicit time integration, uh, we have to solve uh, all uh, equations for all unknowns at once. And this means that uh, we are solving a linear system of equations, uh, Ax uh, equal b, at every time step. Here, A is a, a sparse matrix, and it's typically very large and unfortunately badly conditioned. So uh, to get the idea, um, a production run with JORIC of uh, 30,000 nodes with uh, eight physical variables and four degrees of freedom per node uh, with 21 toroidal harmonics would end up with a matrix size of 40 millions and uh, it would have 500 billion non-zero elements. So in double precision, this would require eight terabyte of memory just for storage. In the figure here, I show the um, structure of a uh, sparse matrix uh, A. This is uh, just for illustration. This is a very small uh, case uh, where due to unstructured mesh, the matrix uh, deviates from a uh, five band structure into generally sparse matrix with symmetric pattern. So uh, on there, Upper corner, the five band structure holds, but uh, as it reaches uh, X point, then uh, it, it becomes general sparse matrix without this uh, uh, more convenient uh, five band structure. So uh, let me talk uh, then about uh, solver. Uh, so, with such large system, the direct LU factorization is usually uh, not possible. Uh, Thus, uh, we use a preconditioner generalized minimum residual uh, or GMRS method with a left precondition. So in a nutshell, this method means that the original system is replaced with a new system where we multiply it by, uh, from the left by a new matrix P, which is called the preconditioner matrix, and the new system now is solved. The criteria for uh, choosing P is that it should be easily interpretable. So we should be able to solve equation for P and that the product P minus one, so invert P uh, A, should have low condition number. So ideally we need to choose P such that it is close to A, but we can solve for P. Then uh, our solver uh, algorithm can be reduced to the following steps. So uh, first, we construct global matrix A and the right-hand side, and this is done on every time step. And then we construct or uh, distribute a preconditioner matrix, and this is done once per several time step. Fortunately, we can reuse preconditioner for several steps uh, in, in uh, typical cases. Next, we analyze and build elimination graph, and this is done only once per simulation run, since the structure of matrix P stays the same. We don't change the read during the run. 
Next, we perform uh, LU factorization for preconditioned matrix. And this is again done once per several steps. And then we perform GMRS iterations. Uh, and this is done every step. Uh, here we find the solution for preconditioner matrix on every iteration with different right hand sides. So now let me uh, describe uh, what kind of preconditioner is implemented before uh, prior to this work. So in the approach implemented prior, uh, the preconditioner matrix was constructed as a set of diagonal blocks of individual toroidal harmonics. So um, schematic structure of preconditioned matrix for small case of four moles is shown in the figure. So here uh, the gray color represents those diagonal blocks represent, uh, representing to, uh, each harmonics. Uh, so we have here n equal zero, the smaller block, and then n equal one for cosine and sine component, two again for sine and cosine, and then three for cosine and sine. So uh, if you uh, think of the original matrix, the original matrix would, full, would be fully covered in gray. And now we neglect, um, uh, we neglect mode coupling. So uh, our approximation to the original matrix is that we just take the uh, harmonics, put them on diagonal blocks and neglect whatever mode coupling is there. Um, now each diagonal block can be solved independently and in parallel. And then the solution is used in the JMRS iteration cycle. Uh, this approach is relatively um, straightforward, fast and scalable uh, with respect to number of modes. Uh, but unfortunately, the highly nonlinear regime uh, where mode coupling is strong, this uh, approach uh, is not uh, is not resembling the original matrix very well, so the GMRS convergence can be quite bad. So how do we deal with that? Well, the question is, if we can bring some of the coupling back, not all of them because we cannot solve the full system, but at least some most important couplings. And uh, the the answer is yes, we can do that. And here we um, propose the following method where we take into account some of the couplings and namely uh, the coupling of neighboring modes. So instead of individual harmonics uh, block, now uh, we have larger uh, overlapping diagonal blocks as shown in the figure. So um, before each block would represent one uh, mode. Now we have blocks representing basically two modes. So we couple n equal zero with n equal one, n equal one with n equal two, and n equal two with n equal three. So now we have certain overlapping as shown in the figure. And because of that, um, we take the contribution of the solution for each block with a factor uh, one half. And then because uh, uh, we have uh, n equal zero and n equal two not uh, uh, overlapped. So we, we need to solve for those first and last harmonics individually. And then uh, getting additional contribution from those blocks as well. So this leads to a total n equal one, where n is number of, uh, 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 of modes, of toroidal modes n equal one diagonal blocks to be solved. And uh, of course, now the blocks are larger, uh, twice larger as, as before. So comparing to individual harmonic case, the performance is not limited to solving the largest block, which is, as I mentioned, twice as large. Uh, so um, as we can see, the contribution uh, is part uh, of coupling now is partially taken into account with a factor of one, two, and as it shows in the light gray in the figure. So we have implemented this uh, new method uh, in JORIP. And here show the test results for a relatively small case of uh, tearing mode simulation in core plasma. 
The simulation uh, size is following. We have number of grid points, uh, 2,400. And here uh, we have uh, two cases, n equal four and eight, n equal, three cases actually, n equal four, n equal seven, and eight, n equal 11. So global matrix size for n equal four case is four, uh, 400,000. And then the number of uh, non-zero elements is about 600 million. So uh, we um, consider simulation in the non-linear phase where standard preconditioner shows bad performance. And uh, in this case, we compare a number of GMRS iteration over the last 20 steps of simulations. And uh, the results are shown in the, the table. So uh, method one is a standard method, method two is a new method. So as we can see, uh, the number of iterations is reduced significantly with a new method. So the convergence happens much faster. And uh, this same trend holds for different number of toroidal models. Uh, in the simulation using a new preconditioner, uh, we are solving in parallel uh, problems of different sizes. Our blocks have different sizes. And then additionally, the numerical factorization, which is performed seldomly, and GMRS iterations scale differently with the number of MPI ranks. So thus, we need the ability for flexible distribution of MPI ranks among families to achieve optimal performance. And here shows the example for four families. Uh, so we have family 1, 2, 2, 3, 0, 1, 3, and 0. And we have 40 MPI tasks. And we distribute them differently. So first uh, column shows the equal distribution of ranks among mod family, and then uh, we put more uh, uh, more tasks on uh, largest families and even more tasks further. As we can see uh, for this example, the optimal performance for both factorization and GMRS iteration cycle is achieved with the uh, following rank distribution: 16, 16, 4, 2, 2. If we put even more uh, ranks towards our largest family, then the performance gets worse. So we need to find the optimal performance. And this is usually can be done by just trying an error. And then uh, now about the real uh, simulation. So on this next slide, I show the application of a new preconditioner uh, for a realistic simulation of vertical displacement event. Uh, the GMRS convergence in the nonlinear stage here is very poor due to strong nonlinear mode coupling. And uh, in this uh, table below, uh, I show the number of GMRS iteration per step for the old and new method. And this is done for different number of toroidal harmonics, uh, four and 11. As we can see, uh, the new method uh, leads to re the reduction of number of iterations in GMRS cycle by, by about a factor of three. And uh, a, a factor of two reduction is observed for the case of 11 modes. So uh, this is a reduction of number of iteration. This is not the whole, uh, uh, whole simulation because there are other parts. So, uh, but with this reduction of number of iteration, uh, with improved preconditioner, we are able to increase the uh, time step in simulation. And we were able to do that, to do this increase by factor of three, getting approximately the same overall simulation time as shown in the figure. Here, uh, we run simulation for uh, 100 time steps. And for all methods, the time step is 0 0.05. And uh, here, we, with all methods, we, we perform factorization only once. We don't need to do that more than once. It took 21 seconds, and then the total time spent in GMRS is uh, 5,332. For the new method, we were able to increase the time step by a factor of 3, so it's 0 0.15. Now, we need to perform 7 factorization during one round. We cannot use, reuse precondition for that long as before. So the total uh, factorization, uh, 7 times 122, end up at 857. But the GMRS, the time spent in GMRS iteration is significantly reduced. 
and together with uh, this increased time step, now we spent approximately the same time on the total simulation, but with an increased time step, of course, this leads to the total performance improvement by about a factor of three. So uh, let me briefly uh, talk about some limitations. So one of the disadvantage of new precondition is increased memory consumption. On this plot, I show memory utilization as a function of runtime. As we can see, there is peak memory usage increased by a factor of two for new preconditioner because of the larger matrix. And uh, the average consumption increased by a roughly effect, uh, order of 50%. We already identified the ways of reducing peak consumption. And for the average, there are other methods which can be implemented as well. Um, so thus I come to the summary. So uh, large scale MSG instabilities need detailed uh, understanding and simulation is a very important tool to, for that. Uh, new precondition based on mod families is implemented in JORAP. Flexible work workload distribution can mitigate the increased numerical factorization time. And then uh, overall speed up of factor of three is demonstrated that in challenging nonlinear VDA simulations, as well as other simulations which are ongoing. So this trend holds. And additionally, I would like to comment that this mod family are fully flexible and thus can be useful for future stellarator simulations. So we, we are not limited to just coupling neighboring modes. We ca can couple whatever modes we want. So that's, that will be very useful in a, in a stellarator uh, case. And this okay. is a reference with a quote. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, very interesting. So since there are some questions from, uh, from us, the first ex example, slide 11, shows the number of iterations for method one scale, method one scales with a number of modes as is expected. Is there an obvious reason why this isn't the case? It's not the case. For the example on slide slide 13, in fact, the opposite? Yes. Uh, well, it depends on the, on the physics. Uh, so we, we cannot predict which mode, which mode coupling is, uh, would be important. So mm -hmm. we kind of assume that, uh, that if we take mode coupling uh, of neighboring modes, that sort of represents uh, uh, turbulence cascading. But of course, there may be particular modes which are coupled, and then it's better to look at the uh, say energy evolution and try to guess which modes may be coupled, and then uh, take those coupling uh, in account explicitly. Uh, so, so this trends with a, with a number of uh, with a number of modes cannot tell us that much. It's just maybe co co coincidence. Okay. Another question from Alberto is <clears throat> asking, is it possible to generate the method from n, n and n plus one nonlinear interactions to n, n plus one, n plus two nonlinear interactions? And how does CPU time scale or can it be kept by more parallelization? Uh, so, um... Yes, we can we can introduce as many mode families as we want, and we may take into account those couplings. Uh, uh, the question may be if we have uh, several modes, uh, several contribution to the uh, to the solution from from different modes. We need to think how how we what kind of linear combination we construct, and uh, with a number of uh, we have good. And, I mean, the scaling is good with the number of uh, with the number of mod families, so we can just throw more uh, ranks and and introduce more families. So so uh, in this sense, this new method is is uh, very favorable favorable uh, towards uh, uh, scaling with number of ranks. I have one. I just want to make a precision. The reason why I ask is because when we have done the QH mode simulations, for instance, with Jorek, the odd numbers couple. So you have one, three, five, et cetera, when, or two, four, six. So there are some, as you mentioned, some phenomena in which the you don't couple to the near mode, but you couple to another one. OK. And, and as I mentioned, it's very flexible. You can you can spe specify which modes, uh, which modes are coupling. OK, thank you. OK, thank you very much. It was nice, uh, nice session. 
So let's have a lunch break. The afternoon session starts at 1.15. So thank you very much for your participation. See you later. Enjoy the lunch. Um, sorry, I, I just want to add that there will be a Mare Nostrum a virtual tour as well for those who want to stay. Or you can have lunch while you're watching the tour with Oriol Ryu. Hi, everybody. Morning, on the air. Yes, this, this is Uriol. So it's, it's my, my, my talk is not as a specific kind of the, the previous one, okay? It's only to, to present you the machine and, and also a tool uh, to, to show you our virtual tour, okay? It's first part is only few slides, okay? It's here. Okay, <laughs> so this is this is our machine. Okay, this, this the first row is the, the storage. Then we have two two uh, lines with uh, the, the the processors. In the middle, we have the root of the network. Okay, that the tricky point here is that we are in, in a charge. It's not really old. It's from 1950. Okay, it's only 70 years old. So this machine is called Mare Nostrum. It's the fourth version we have installed here. The first one was installed in 2004, and uh, this is the, it's, it's new from 17, okay? So you know top 500 list, this is since last week, we are in 42 in the world, okay? So there is no other supercomputer in the world in a place like this, Does we are we are different, okay, at least. So, so supercomputer is not more powerful to be in a charge. It's more beautiful only. Okay, so it's only briefly to, to present you the, the, the center. Uh, we, are, we are near uh, 800 people working here. Uh, 600 of them are researchers. So our main uh, goal always is research, not to have a powerful machine for us. Marostrum is only a tool to research better. Okay, so we are a public consortium, a Spanish government, Catalan one, and this university. Uh, this is our four groups of research computer, earth, and life science. Sorry. In computer science, uh, we want. Uh, our goal is to influence to the future of supercomputers, the way they will be built, and how we are, and how we are going to use them. Earth science mainly is uh, the project about climate change, uh, predicting new models. Now we are doing predictions in the medium time, in 20, 25 years. It's more useful to talk with politicians in this case, okay? Uh, also, model, modeling air quality from local places, as Barcelona, for instance, to regions, to, to regions, countries, and, and so on. Life science is a huge field. We are studying living organisms in all the life cycle. So here you can find computational genomics, machine learning, drug modeling, and so on. And of course, case, 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 case uh, group is the one, uh, you know, fusion group belongs to this group, okay? So this group is the most heterogeneous groups in BCC. We have people from different fields of research. It depends on, on, on each project, okay? This group is the, the one that's uh, in relation with companies. So the machine, and then we're going to start to start the, the, the virtual tour. So this is the... This is the evolution of our supercomputer. As I mentioned before, Marston One, we installed it in 2004 and the last one in, in, in 17. Okay, we are now planning to uh, install new Marston, Marston 5, very original, Marston 5, and the uh, few uh, first months of, of 21. Okay, so we always divided, we have always different kinds of machines. General purpose one is the, the, the 
the powerful one, 11 petaflops, and others not so powerful. We call them new technologies. Those we can evaluate in order to know if we can use them in the future minor streams, okay? So you see the first one is Power9 with GPUs, NVIDIA Volta, 1.5 petaflops. Uh, it's top, top two in, in Spain, this machine also. Uh, maybe it's one of the solution for Marson 5. So you, you, you can see here we have it from 18. Then we have another solutions in order to evaluate them for Marston 6. Uh, ARM is the technology top one in the, in the world just now since June 20. Uh, yeah. And AMD is the option for uh, states to install top one in the world in next month. Okay, yeah, exaflop machine. Okay. So 20% of this machine, of the use of the machine is for uh, internal usage for internal researchers, 20% for Spanish one, and 60% for European one. Uh, we are part of a praise uh, network. We have seven machines. We have seven machines, three in Germany, another in France, another in Italy, Switzerland one, and, and our machine, okay? So it's a brief introduction to the center and to the to our research i'm going to show you if you go to our web page we have here in english we have here the our uh, virtual visit you go there you have this this view okay so this is the place we where we work it's a garden of the university it's very nice. So you can go and you can have your virtual visit. You have a lot of information here. You can go on your own. There are, we divided the, the, the visit in two plans. First floor is a, a, you have all the green, green, sorry, it's not in English. Yeah, this one. With gray uh, color, it's uh, general or technical information. And in the first floor uh, upstairs, we have a uh, red color is for uh, research information, okay? So you can go step by step and see the, all, all the, the building of the machine. Also, if you, go, if you go here in these windows, you can, you can go directly to any 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 place okay so for instance you can go inside you can see this is the charge you can see the, the this kind of, of windows okay it's very nice you can you have here a video with all the technical information about the, the machine and uh, it's not allowed to go inside in a in a usual uh, uh, visit to, to the building but in this virtual visit it's allowed you can go there you can see as i mentioned before the first row is for uh, for storage okay you can go inside and see all all the the blades the processors the boards okay you have you can do a zoom here you can see all the all the elements of the blade of the board. Sorry, and more information here. This is a, a photograph, a view of the technical floor beneath the the machines. It's a very nice picture with all the rush, all the the network we have inside. Uh, here we have near one hundred kilometers of network. First floor, uh, first level uh, in blue, or kind of blue, it's fiber. It's to connect all the boards point to point. And in yellow, we have gigabit. It's to connect, uh, it's, it's, it's for sysadmin use, is to manage the machine. Okay. So follow, you can go to the back part. 
Okay, you see here, both lines are the Marius to four, the machine, the current machine. Here in the, in the middle, this is the, this, uh, a new technology machine. It's the one with power nine and NVIDIA Volta. Okay, so about cooling and Inside the environment is at uh, 23 Celsius degrees, homogeneous everywhere, the same temperature. You know, you have in the front part 23, it goes to the board and becomes hither and hither. Okay. So you see here, there is a huge, huge door in the back part. If you open this door, it goes air maybe at, I don't know, more than 50 Celsius degrees. Okay. Very, very hot. So, uh, but if you close it, there goes at 23. It's a, it's a magical door. So if you see here below the door, there, there are uh, black tubes. These black tubes connect this unit. Okay. So from here it's better. Connect this unit with all, all the back doors. This is the water cooling. We are connecting cold water to all the back doors. Okay. It's in order to uh, for efficiency uh, energy. Can you, you think that we are uh, every year we need to pay 1.5 million euros only for electricity? Okay. Okay, so we can go upstairs uh, directly from this window or step by step. Okay. Here you can see all the machine from this corridor, and also you can go to this. Uh, uh, to this uh, bridge that it's over the machine. It's a view, nice, it's a nice view from here. You have all the charge, both corridors and the machine just below it. Okay, so I mentioned before, here you can see the red uh, colors, uh, red cycles. Uh, it's for um, research uh, uh, information. Okay, so you have a video with eight different kind of, of project. And here are uh, another kind of videos of research. Uh, you go here, you can see there is a door. Okay, so behind this door, Mars 5 will be soon. Okay, so we are going to install there. Mars 5 not in this building. That's because new machine, Mars 5 will be 20 times more powerful than this one. So it doesn't fit here. We need another place. This is about 200 square meters. Uh, in the new uh, building, we have six floors of 1,000 square meters each one. So we're going to install Marston 5 in the new building. Okay, so we can go downstairs again. Now, not directly, step by step, slowly. Okay, so from this, you can see new building just from this door, uh, this window. Okay. This is the new one. Okay. It's just very, very near. It's 10 meters from here. And finally, and at the end, finally, we have here a corridor we call a, our museum. It's to show you the different uh, machines we have had installed in our center, not only in this building, so in another buildings in, in, in the campus. Okay, so this is the zoom. This is this is Mars. This is just one rack from Mars to C. Okay, you can see all the technical information of all the machines. Here we have a machine with uh, the ARM processors. This is from 2008. It's the first machine in the world with uh, ARM processors. It's the first supercomputer in the world. And so on, okay, it's the, the newest, is from 2017, March 3, sorry, uh, 12, 2012, March 2, 6, March 2, 1, 4, and so on, okay, so this another machines. And at the, here we have the last two machines. We, we always have the same. Yes. The same policy. We, we always have uh, two kinds of machines. Okay, so we have always the general purpose one at Marston 4, 
and the, the new technology as the power nine. Okay, so in 1902, we had this one was the general purpose machine, and this, the, the black box, is the specific kind of. Okay, so you can see here the technical information. This machine in 2000, no, sorry, in 92 was Tower in Spain and it cost $1 million. You can see here it's less than one gigaflop. So maybe your, your smartphone is more powerful than this, this machine. Okay. Uh, here you have the, the, the specific kind. Well, so very, very quick. This is the virtual tour. Uh, you can go to our web page and visit on your own. Okay. So that's all. Thanks. Thank you, Oriol. Okay. Bye. Bye.